Okay, colleagues, I suggest we, um, we start today's session. Welcome, everybody. Um, another hearing in the context of the inquiry um, on mass surveillance. Um, today we'll be listening um, to two rounds of speakers. We'll have two sessions. The first session is an exchange of views with U.S. civil society. Uh, and the second session will be dedicated to uh, whistleblowers' activities in the field of surveillance and, um, very important, their legal protection. Um, I'm not going to make very long introductory remarks. Um, today we're going to hear from two uh, very eminent um, and visible uh, U.S. organizations in the area of uh, civil liberties and data protection. Um, we have two speakers. First of all, Mark Rottenberg from EPIC, who's no stranger to us because you've been before this committee before, or in any case uh, in this parliament before on several occasions. Um, and after that, we'll be listening to Mrs. Catherine Crump from the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, a staff attorney. So um, I'll ask Mark Rottenberg to kick off the debate. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, members of the Committee of the European Parliament, friends and guests, and those with the National Security Agency who may be reading my email. Thank you for your attention this afternoon. My name is Mark Rotenberg. I am director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center in Washington, D.C. We are a nonpartisan research organization. We are not affiliated with any political party in the United States. We do not receive money from any government agency, nor do we receive money from any private company. We simply try to represent the views of Internet users on emerging privacy and civil liberties issues. I should say at the outset also we work closely with civil liberties and consumer privacy organizations within the U.S. and also with NGOs and civil society organizations around the world. Last week, in fact, we organized an important conference in Warsaw, Poland. The title of the conference, Our Data, Our Lives. Our focus is on the protection of privacy in our modern age. You have asked me today to speak about the views of civil society groups in the U.S., and I will make a few remarks, tell you what I think we have accomplished, tell you what more needs to be done, and then urge you to take certain specific actions. Let me begin by saying that since 9-11, civil liberties organizations in the United States have worked together to try to establish greater accountability and oversight for the tremendous surveillance authorities that were put in place by such legislation as the Patriot Act, the creation of fusion centers, new systems of biometric identification, and other forms of tracking and monitoring of persons within the United States. We've had some successes, but we've also had some setbacks. Some provisions of the Patriot Act were modified to our um, uh, agreement. Other provisions were expanded in ways that we did not favor. And specifically with regard to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, we were very disappointed when the U.S. Congress chose to expand that law, which was originally intended to focus on the narrow problem of monitoring foreign agents, spies operating in the United States, to a much broader, broader category of data collection than we believe that the law had allowed. But for all of our setbacks and some of our successes, nothing really prepared us for the document that was disclosed at the beginning of this summer by Mr. Snowden. It was an order issued by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in the United States that compelled the U.S. telephone company Verizon to turn over all of the telephone records of all of its customers on an ongoing basis without exception for solely domestic communication. I have taught privacy law for more than 20 years in the United States. I have never seen a court order 
that granted such broad authority issued. And the fact that it was secretive and that there was no opportunity to challenge the theory of the order or to require the government to set out its justification set out enormous alarms in the civil liberties community. The ACLU, which had already begun a very important litigation that had gone before the U.S. Supreme Court just the year before, recognized, as we did, that that order was unlawful. They filed a challenge in district court in New York. We filed a challenge directly to the U.S. Supreme Court. Some people said to us initially, what is the basis of your challenge? Surely a court can issue orders to gather evidence. I said a court must have the authority, it must have a legal basis when it seeks to collect such a broad range of evidence as this court believed it had when it issued that order. The skepticism about our case gave way to support and soon law professors experts in privacy law, national security law, even the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, filed briefs in support of our case to the U.S. Supreme Court, saying that this is a matter that must be heard, that order is unlawful, it must be overturned. With our case and the work of the ACLU and others, there have been many other efforts underway in the United States to respond to a growing awareness of a type of surveillance program that even following 9-11 we could not have conceived would be established in the United States. We could not have imagined that all of our internet traffic flowing through companies based in the U.S. would be readily accessible to the NSA. And just as I thought I understood the full scope of the program and prepared for my remarks in this speech to you today, over this weekend the New York Times gave us another blockbuster report. Because according to the New York Times, the National Security Agency can augment the communications data with material from public, commercial, and other sources, including bank codes, insurance information, Facebook profiles, passenger manifests, voter registration rolls, GPS location information, as well as property records and unspecified tax data, according to the documents released this weekend. Those type of profiles on U.S. citizens maintained by a U.S. agency are a violation of the Privacy Act. And a subsequent investigation, apart from the current investigation concerning the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, must now be undertaken. But I don't think I've said anything to you so far today that addresses what I know is your concern. And that is, what are we to say about the U.S. surveillance of EU citizens? Now, I want to begin my remarks on this point by saying a few things simply. I do believe that all governments have an obligation to protect the security of their citizens. And I do believe that all governments have the right to seek to identify threats against their nation. On these key points, I don't think any of us would disagree. The question is, how does a government, how does a democratic government distinguish between those who are friends and allies and those who are actual threats? In the original conception of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the aim was to create legal authorities focused on the actual threats to the U.S. and still, within law, to create a basis to undertake electronic surveillance. We are so far today from that fundamental premise 
about the conduct of electronic surveillance, it is if the principle of law has been stood upside down. The NSA has been guided at every moment by a desire to obscure, evade, sidestep, misinterpret, ignore legal authorities for the purpose of expanding its data collection practices. People concerned about privacy and civil liberties, whether they are in Europe or in the United States, must share an equal concern about that problem. So what are we to do? Let me make three brief recommendations. Governments engage in communications on a wide range of issues. Governments engage in communications for the purpose of promoting trade and commerce, oftentimes to the benefit of their businesses and their consumers. But I know I speak for the leaders of consumer organizations in both the United States and Europe when I suggest to you today that it might be a wise move on the European side to suspend trade negotiations pending the resolution of the surveillance investigation. Because whatever benefits might be obtained from greater trade will necessarily be denied to individuals if when their personal data travels across national borders they cannot be assured the protections of privacy they would otherwise have in their own nations. You should not go forward with new trade agreements unless you have adequate assurance for the protection of privacy. In a similar spirit, let me suggest that you might want to look once again at the current frameworks for the transfer of PNR data and SWIFT data, the passenger records and the banking records. There are interests on both sides of the Atlantic in establishing a framework that makes it possible to identify genuine threats to the security both of the United States and of Europe. And I'm not suggesting anything otherwise. However, the problem on the European side is that when your data goes to the United States, you lack the protections that would otherwise be provided for U.S. citizens by the U.S. Privacy Act. This came, comes about for historical reasons. When the Privacy Act was adopted in 1974, very few lawmakers conceived of a day when U.S. federal agencies would be routinely collecting the personal information of citizens of other governments. And so, perhaps not unreasonably, the drafters of the Privacy Act established strong legal protections for U.S. citizens. But we are now almost 40 years ahead of that day. And in this day, in our era, your financial records, your travel records, publicly available information, just about anything that can be digitized increasingly flows to U.S. federal agencies. Perhaps in some circumstances it's necessary to collect this data, but I cannot imagine the rationale that says it's okay to collect the data and not establish appropriate privacy safeguards as would be found in the Privacy Act. One doesn't even need to be a fan of privacy to understand this argument. Principles of reciprocity and comity are well established in international law. And if the U.S. seeks this data on European citizens, it should provide the same safeguards for Europeans that it does for Americans. My final point is the urgent, the urgent need to establish an international framework for privacy protection. I know this is a matter of great concern here in this body, 
I know it is a matter that Commissioner Redding and others have spoken to many times over the last several years. EPIC and other NGOs have urged the United States to ratify the Council of Europe Privacy Convention because we see that as an appropriate framework already in place that could help establish safeguards for privacy when data crosses national borders. But we are aware also that there is an increasing movement to look at the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in particular Article 17, which speaks to privacy protection. The covenant has been ratified by the United States and many other countries and was recently endorsed by the data protection commissioners at their meeting in Warsaw. And so perhaps this is both the end point for my remarks and the beginning of how we begin to frame privacy protection in our modern age. Words that were actually set out first in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Let me share these with you. No one shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his privacy, family, home, or correspondence, nor to unlawful attacks on his honor and reputation. Everyone has the right to the protection of the law against such interference or attacks. These words are as timely today as when they were set out in 1948. They describe the common work of democratic governments that seek to protect the privacy of their citizens. My hope is that this is a common concern shared by governments on both sides of the Atlantic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the Thank you. Then I'll in invite uh, our second speaker, Mrs. Crump of the American Civil Liberties Union. You have the floor for about 15 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we have yes. Thanks. I'm obviously new here. I appreciate the help. On behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union, I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today about mass electronic surveillance issues. The ACLU is a nationwide civil society organization with more than 500,000 members, which is dedicated to the principles of liberty and equality set out in the U.S. Constitution and in federal statutory law. I understand that the goal of this hearing is to establish facts as regards the allegations reported in the media, such as the scope, legality, and proportionality of the alleged surveillance programs. Given this, I'll spend my time today identifying recently revealed programs of surveillance that are of particular concern to the ACLU, EPIC, and other domestic civil society organizations within the United States. And then I will describe the type of advocacy efforts we have all been engaged in in an effort to rein in these programs. It is my hope that by describing the work of U.S. civil society organizations, that will aid this committee's thinking in going forward when deciding on its own course of action. Thanks to Edward Snowden and a handful of particularly courageous reporters, we are now having a debate about mass surveillance in the United States that is long overdue. Over the past three months, it has become clear that the National Security Agency is engaged in far-reaching, intrusive, and in certain respects unlawful surveillance of telephone calls and electronic communications, not only inside the United States, but around the world. Under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, as Mark Rotenberg mentioned, uh, the NSA is collecting all telephone metadata of every single phone call into, out of, and within the United States. Under 702 of the FISA Amendment Act of 2008, the NSA is surveilling the content of electronic communications around the world to an extent not previously understood. These are the most commonly discussed programs, but of course there are others. Through the Hemisphere Project, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration has routine access using subpoenas without judicial approval to an enormous database of AT&T call records stretching back as far as 1987. 
While this particular program appears geared towards aiding domestic law enforcement investigations, Europeans should take note that these mass surveillance programs will not long be limited to foreign intelligence and national security purposes. And one of the most troubling allegations, of course, is that the NSA appears to have defeated most encryption tools used to guard global commerce, banking systems, to protect sensitive data like trade secrets and medical records, and to secure emails, web searches, internet chats, and phone calls. Security researchers have, of course, pointed out that by making these communications more accessible to the NSA, the NSA may well have made these communications more accessible to foreign adversaries and private corporations. I'm going to use the rest of my time to describe the ACLU's advocacy efforts in some detail. First, on the NSA's collection of the content of Internet communications. For many years, the ACLU has been deeply concerned about the scope of Section 702 of the FISA Amendment Act, which is the legal basis for the disclosed PRISM and Upstream programs. While many questions remain about the exact scope of these programs, they prompt deep concern because private citizens around the world have a strong interest in ensuring that governments do not engage in mass collection of communications content and only surreptitiously access such content in a targeted manner when there is a strong reason to do so. The U.S. government has suggested that Americans should be unconcerned with its content collection programs on the ground that they target foreigners. But this argument should be rejected for a number of reasons. First, while we're not naive about foreign intelligence operations, all countries engage in these, there's an important distinction between surveillance of other governments and large-scale surveillance of foreign populations. And second, even if it were the case that no law or treaty prohibits such mass surveillance, that doesn't mean government should engage in it. Now that Snowden has pulled back the curtain on the extent of these practices, we hope that citizens in democratic countries will speak out against them and impose new limits. And second, of course, contrary to the U.S. government's representations, Americans' communications are, in fact, collected under these programs. The NSA's procedures permit it to monitor Americans' international communications in the course of speaking with foreigners that are targeted abroad. I want to mention that in 2008, the ACLU, supported by organizations such as EPIC, filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of this very provision. In the lawsuit, Amnesty International it was, uh, versus Clapper was filed on behalf of a broad coalition of attorneys and human rights activists, labor, legal, and media organizations whose work requires them to engage in sensitive communications with individuals outside the United States. These include colleagues, clients, foreign sources, victims of hate crime and abuse. Um, and the coalition of, individual, of organizations that sued include Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, The Nation Magazine, and the Service Employees International Union. Unfortunately, in February of 2013, the United States Supreme Court dismissed this lawsuit on the grounds that our clients lack standing because they could not sufficiently establish that their communications were being monitored. It is impossible not to wonder today, had Snowden's revelations come somewhat earlier, whether that case would have turned out differently. Second, I want to add a few words about the NSA's mass call tracking program. This, as Mark mentioned, is the program that was startlingly disclosed by The Guardian on June 5th, revealing that every phone call into, out of, or within the United States is being collected by the National Security Agency on a daily, ongoing basis. As many have noted, this program is simply breathtaking in its scope. It's as though the NSA has collected access to the address book of every single American and logging who they spoke with and for how long. We have since learned that the mass acquisition of these types of call detail records extend to all of the country's major, uh, major telephone companies and that the program stretches back at least seven years. The ACLU was particularly startled by the Guardian story which focused on an order from Verizon because we ourselves are Verizon telephony customers. So uh, about a week after the article was filed, we filed suit in federal court uh, to challenge the mass call tracking program. 
Um, and we've argued that this program violates both the First Amendment right to free speech and the Fourth Amendment right to be free from intrusive government surveillance. The U.S. Constitution's Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. President Obama and others in the administration have been at pains to stress that this program involves only collection of telephony metadata and not content. But for Fourth Amendment purposes, that distinction is irrelevant. The relevant Fourth Amendment question is whether the program impinges on reasonable expectation of, of privacy. I don't have to tell this committee how uh, uh, crucial uh, someone's telephone logs can be, revealing, for example, uh, everyone they called, even one phone call to someone like a, a, you know, a domestic violence hotline can be revealing, but someone's pattern of phone calls over days uh, can reveal much about their associations. The ACLU has also sought to invalidate this program on First Amendment grounds, arguing it infringes both the freedom of speech and association. The U.S. Supreme Court has long recognized that the ability to engage in discourse in civil society depends on some ability to engage in communications free from government interference. The ACLU itself receives phone calls on a regular basis from whistleblowers, perhaps government employees or others who wish to disclose facts to us about conduct that they believe is unlawful. The mere fact that these communications take place is itself confidential, and we've asked the court to invalidate the program on this ground as well. Although I've discussed primarily our litigation, the ACLU is also very active in Congress, and we've joined with other organizations to press Congress to narrow the scope of the uh, call, uh, the Section 215, which authorizes the call program, to require that communications intercepted be substantially related uh, to a foreign terrorist organization. In this way, uh, the statute would be narrowed in a way that both safeguards U.S. and foreign citizens from mass, uh, mass call logging. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to testify today, and I look forward to any questions. Okay, thank you very much uh, to both speakers. Um, I think the... Um very good. The, the routine is known by now. Uh, we have a first round uh, of questions by the Rapporteur and the Shadows. Uh, then we'll ask the, the, both speakers to, uh, to answer the questions. Uh, and then if there's sufficient time, we'll have a second round of questions. I already have a few uh, requests for the floor, um, but I ask everybody to really be as concise as possible and leave some time for your colleagues as well. Um, Mr. Rapporteur. Thank you to both our guests. You're going to get a lot of questions. We've now had enough hearings to know that, so I'm going to keep my questions brief. Um, to Mark um, Rottenberg, you, you made a very good contribution, and you ended it on Article 17 of the International Covenant um, on Civil and Political Rights, and you gave us some recommendations for us on SWIFT, TFTP, and so on for which we're grateful. Um, but I wanted to just ask you about the US experience, because of course that, inter that international covenant is about protection for us um, and our protections. So what I wanted to ask you first of all was uh, where you think the Congress is going to be this week on the Lee uh, legislation and where you think this covenant stands, because we have a report to write and we need to know how far we're covered by the US and how far we need to cover ourselves. So that's my first question. And we need an analysis from Americans as to where we stand. Secondly, um, the difficult question of, of the three recommendations that you had for us on SWIFT, on our trade agreements, and so on. Um, it, it's good making these recommendations, but um, to go a little bit more in depth as to where you see that, um, that going. Uh, so, for example, we, we suspend SWIFT and so on. But where do you see that feeding into the U.S. legislative mind and where you, you see that going? Um, and thirdly, um, just a quick question on, on our data protection regulation and directive. Um, you didn't mention the interface between that and what we're doing uh, here in the inquiry. And if you have any thoughts on that, sorry, it's also to our colleague from ACLU, um, also to you, whether you have any thoughts on that. Okay, so do, do you mind if we just um, take all the, the questions first? Yeah. Okay, so um, the shadows. Mr. Voss for the EPP. Yeah, oh, 
Oh, that is. Auch ich möchte Well, I would too like to thank both speakers. Zehn Sekunden. Auch ich möchte well, I too would like to thank both speakers. There were very interesting presentations from the American perspective. I just have a couple of questions, in particular on the question of the recommendations that Mr. Hottenberg gave us. I'm a bit hesitant about some of that because English, English is on channel 2. Can you hear English? Yes. Um, well, I'm a little bit hesitant about the recommendations that you made because on the question of the free trade agreement, I think that you can use the free trade agreement to implement or impose data protection standards and not say, well, let's just uh, freeze everything until it's uh, in place. But we could say, well, let's have data protection standards and let's negotiate them as part of the FTA. Secondly, on in the agreements we currently have with the USA, well, my feeling is that we have two different pr uh, procedures here. We have the legal way, as it were, where you have an agreement and the non-legal way that things are being done by way of the NSA. And uh, I really don't think we should get rid of the legal path uh, in order to try to um, stop the illegal procedures. And so I think the question might be that if we want to create international data protection, well, then we as Europeans really need to um, – we, we, we shouldn't assume that our level is the one that's going to be kept to, but what level is it? the one that you would like to see, a European one or an American one. You know, there may end up also being a Chinese and a Russian level which needs to be part of the discussions as well. But I think we need to be clear in any case that there are different uh, points of view and different levels. And so what would international principles of data protection be? Do they already exist? And if they do, what would they be? Thank you very much. I, um, I am the shadow for Alder, but for reasons of courtesy, I'll skip myself and put myself at the end of the list. So next on the list um, is Mr. Albrecht for the Greens. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, first of all, uh, for being here with us and uh, bringing us your perspective. I think uh, there's one first uh, very interesting idea which came into my mind to ask you what do you think would happen if um, services from abroad seen from the United States uh, based in other third states would be spied on by on legal grounds non-U.S. law legal grounds in, in the extent like uh, the NSA does at the moment with services like Yahoo and Google and uh, all the information by European citizens. Uh, could you elaborate a bit perhaps how this is seen because we have the uh, quite strange situation that uh, there are so many services based in the United States and this becomes of, of course a problem for users from the European Union with their information, their personal data. Uh, but we also see that there is such a restricted debate in the United States on American citizens, U.S. American citizens' rights. And uh, is there any uh, opportunity to perhaps overcome that also with regard to international standards? I think that's only possible if we raise that having in mind the negotiations on the US-EU data protection framework agreement, which is struggling to come forward because there's no pressure, no incentive for the US government to uh, work on, on the particular interest of uh, changing the Privacy Act for non-US citizens, for example. And uh, the second question is, um, when it's about transparency reports also to the, with regard to the access uh, to, to data, uh, wouldn't that make sense to really be accelerated to also an international level to uh, really demand transparency on access by governments and to get some framework uh, on that? 
isn't it also an idea to pass that on even to the United Nations? Um, uh, I have the impression that this uh, uh, is an, an interesting idea and also with regard to the International Covenant on S Civil and Political Rights, uh, are there any movements for enforcement in the United States or uh, is there no uh, movement also by the government with regard to infringements, possible infringements to this treaty? Thank you very much. Thank you. The ECR shadow is absent and I don't see anybody else to represent the ECR, so we go to the GUE, Mrs. Ernst. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for joining us so that we can experience firsthand that we're not alone to suffer, but you're suffering too and that we're common partners in an alliance on both sides of the ocean. For us, the situation uh, appears to be hopeless, but I really don't think it is hopeless. I have various questions. If you look at these things alongside each other, what's the big hurdle preventing us from making a change? What's standing in the way the most, uh, preventing us from nipping the situation in the bud? What should we be working on? What do we have to tackle? I don't think it's just a legal thing. It's a question of the fundamentals. What should we really be aiming at to make the change? I'm sure we've talked about umpteen laws, but still haven't cracked the problem. So what's our way in to solving the problem? I'd like to hear that. There's been discussion of international frameworks and international standards, but before we get there, I think they have to be changes made in our minds to learn to respect one another and to recognize the necessity to take action. I think something has to happen first before all those changes. The second point, of course, is the free trade agreement. Mr. Rotenberg, I think you said it's very important for us to start looking at these treaties at an early stage before they're finished being negotiated. Now, I think so too. A lot of people are talking about using the free trade agreement and trying to negotiate issues like data protection whilst doing it. But perhaps you could explain an idea you talked about. If US citizens are being spied on, What's the legal situation there? Amongst the ordinary people, is there some sort of movement like we have in our countries? People saying that this situation is not on. Uh, are people on their own or is there some reaction uh, to being spied on? Uh, is it just the Europeans that feel like that or do we have a shared problem? Now I will ask some questions uh, on behalf of uh, Alde. Uh, very, very quickly, because I have many questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know uh, what is your, your view on the effectiveness of FOIA as a kind of counterweight against uh, surveillance? I always have the feeling it's much more effective than the, uh, the European Transparency Regulation, but there are still limits. Second question. Um, all these mass surveillance programs are always justified by uh, the need for security. Uh, well, we all want security, as Mark Rottenberg underlined, but what evidence do we have that we actually get security? Is there any evidence of, the, um, uh, of, of, of results, of the effectiveness? Is there any way of checking? Do the oversight mechanisms work, congressional, judicial oversight mechanisms? And the, the opposite, do we have any evidence that data are being used for uh, purposes that are not related to security? I mean, we get, some, uh, we get the idea that they are being used for other purposes. Um, then um, what about, because aren't there other legal instruments, I think Mark Rottenberg hinted at it, to, to get information? There are you know, many instruments for mutual legal assistance. Why don't the, the Americans simply ask us for information rather than just lay their fingers on our databases? Um, 
two final questions about your allies, because I'm always very impressed by the, the work done by uh, American civil liberties organizations. Who are your interlocutors, your, your counterparts in Europe? Um, I mean, I always hope for the, um, uh, the, 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 the emergence of an, a, a European civil liberties union. <laughs> Um, but are you working together with organizations in Europe? Is that helpful? Uh, and what allies do you have in other countries? For example, Brazil, that wasn't too happy about the Americans snooping on the phone calls of their president um, either. So that would conclude our first round of questions. So I'll ask you to answer the questions and then we'll have a second round. I already have five requests uh, for the floor, but I'll first uh, ask you to answer the questions. Mark, first. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'll try to be uh, brief and, and not repetitive. Um, Mr. Chair, you asked uh, several very good questions about what the outcomes will be in the U.S. And I think it's worth noting that even though the U.S. government is prepared to shut itself down tonight over deep political division on the interest of, on the issue of the NSA's telephone record collection program, there is surprising agreement across the political spectrum that the program is wrong and should end. In fact, this summer, a junior conservative member of Congress fell five votes short of simply ending the funding for the NSA's telephone collection program. It was a vote widely supported by both Republicans and Democrats. It was very surprising, but it gives me hope at least with respect to the conduct in the U.S., that there are going to be changes. The President has announced reforms, Congress is holding hearings, the academic community is focused, the NGOs are working hard, but here is the problem. On the current course, those changes will have no meaningful impact on the surveillance that's taking place in Europe. And that's what you need to be aware of. You understand that the U.S. opposition to the surveillance activities and the likely changes that will result may help solve the problem of surveillance in the United States. They are unlikely to touch the issue of surveillance outside of the U.S. Now, to a couple of other points, uh, both to you, Mr. Chair, and to Mr. Voss, who asked about these proposals that I have made and whether it really makes sense or what the outcome would be, for example, of holding off on trade negotiation pending a, an outcome on the privacy front. I think this is one of the ways you can, in fact, get concrete results if the requests are reasonable and undertaken with the goal of achieving both privacy protections and long-term improvements in trade. The specific recommendation I'm making is that you seek from the U.S. Congress changes in the Privacy Act that establish in law legal safeguards for the records of European citizens. That's all. And to the extent that U.S. federal agencies choose to collect that information, which they don't necessarily have to do, but they believe is important, then you should be assured that there are legal protections set out in statute not a letter agreement, which is what you currently have, to safeguard the information of your citizens. I think it's the responsible position to take. I hardly think it's uh, radical. That's why I'm suggesting you make uh, these proposals. Uh, the chair also talked about the significant changes taking place to the um, uh, data director of the General Protection on Data Regulation and all the very good work of Mr. Albrecht and, and his uh, colleagues. Uh, we have also in the U.S., urge the implementation of the President's proposal for Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. It's actually a very good framework for consumer privacy protection that the President uh, announced more than a year ago. But there's been no legislative action, so it has no legal force and it provides no protections for U.S. consumers. If there were more pressure brought to bear to enact the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, then I think you would see a ripple effect to Europe U.S. businesses would engage in better privacy practices to your benefit. Um, also to Mr. Voss, you raised the question of um, the, the legal problems, you know, how do we confront a situation where there's a legal agreement in place? And I think the obvious concern here is that you have to worry about enforcement. When you have a safe harbor arrangement, for example, that stands in place of law, 
It's not necessarily bad, but you have to be prepared to answer the question, is that arrangement enforced in practice? Because if it's not, then the legal protections you think you have don't actually exist. So all I'm saying at this point is pursue that issue so that you're satisfied with regard to the enforcement of the arrangement. Um, Mr. Albrecht talks about the importance of data transparency, uh, which we do fully support. I think one of the best mechanisms of privacy protection, almost paradoxically, is allow people to know what information is being kept about them. There is nothing that makes an organization, public or private, more responsible to an individual than to know that someday that person may come to them and say, I'd like to see what you have about me, where you got it from, and how you use that data. Now, my view is that a transparent, you know, decent organization with some integrity will have a good answer when that moment comes. But I suspect that most organizations, public and private, won't. So transparency actually becomes the key uh, to data protection. Um, Ms. Ernst, I, I think, rightly says, how do we solve these problems? And I'm trying as best as I can to give you, you know, concrete recommendations. I do see changes in the Privacy Act as a concrete change that would help very much. I do see the enactment of the Consumer Privacy's Bill of Rights as a concrete outcome. And I also see uh, an international privacy framework as a direction to go. In the United States, you asked, what are we doing? Well, uh, specifically, we looked at the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We looked at the secret court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and working with the ACLU and EFF and other civil liberties groups in the United States, meeting with the president and his staff. We have now obtained the public release of key judicial opinions. We think that's important. We now have new data that wasn't previously available about the use of the legal authorities. We think that's important. There's a proposal to create a public ombudsman to argue the case against the government when judges are asked to make these determinations. We think that's important. There are many things that can be done within the U.S. system to improve accountability and oversight. All of that is going forward, but again, it won't necessarily change the situation here in Europe. Finally, um, Briefly, you know, Sophie asked about something that's also near and dear to our heart, which is the Freedom of Information Act. Literally, the other side of the coin, when you're talking about the rights of citizens in the information society, uh, we're pursuing several uh, FOIA matters uh, concerning uh, the government's conduct. I'm sure that the pressure that has been brought to bear by Mr. Snowden has made uh, the agencies more transparent, more information is being released. I think we need to continue to press. I mean, at the end of the day, these records, these activities are about the activities of government, and we, the people, have the right to know. Thank you very much. I think it's funny that you should mention that a decent and transparent organization will tell people what records they hold on those people, because it brings back to mind when I asked the American government what records they hold on me, <laughs> and they weren't very ready to tell me, <laughs> not even after a court case. Um, Ms. Crum. Thank you. I'll add a few more comments, trying not to be duplicative of what Mr. Rotenberg was mentioning earlier. Um, so one question was about what would happen if other countries did to uh, Internet companies located in their borders what the NSA does to companies like Facebook and Google? And the answer is, of course, in the United States, people would be outraged. And if there were a viable domestic alternative, they would take it. If this, uh, Snowden's revelations have highlighted anything. They've highlighted uh, what many uh, governments will recognize as a mistake to be so heavily dependent on another country's Internet infrastructure. And, of course, it is the NSA's fear that uh, that, that will change and, in, in consequence, diminish its capabilities. On transparency reports, you know, I, in some ways they're good, but I'm afraid that this movement for transparency report is going to be too little too late and the transparency isn't going to be meaningful. Think about the Verizon order, for instance. Verizon may get a handful of orders from, from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court a year, right? And if all you know is the number of orders, you may get a number like 12 or 
six, right? But if you need, so you need a meaningful metric like the number of people who are covered, and of course in that case it would be hundreds of millions of people, right? Um, the other thing that makes me a little skeptical about the transparency reports is uh, that where has everyone been all these years, right? Some of the internet services providers like Google and Yahoo have actually been better than the telecommunications companies. I spent years litigating Freedom of Information Act requests trying to get the telephone companies to provide Americans answers to the basic question of how long it stores various types of data about them. For example, how long does it store their text messages? How long does it store uh, records of who they called and who called them? Um, and I actually never got that answer from the federal government. I finally got it from a small town in Hickory, North Carolina, which handed over in response to a local Public Records Act request a Department of Justice document, which on one page gave us exactly how long each telecommunications carrier stored each of these types of data. It's not like that was a particularly difficult piece of paper to put together, but the telecommunications companies didn't tell Americans that for years. And so while I'm happy to see some move towards transparency now, um, you know, I think, I think it's motivated more by the concern of, 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 of business interests and people believing that, that you know, you're overseas in particular, that their privacy is at stake than, um, than by any radical change of heart. Um, so on, on the FOIA front, you know, there, FOIA can be a useful toy, but to, a useful tool, but it is obviously inadequate. If anything demonstrated the inadequacy of FOIA, it is just how much we've learned uh, from Edward Snowden over the past six, or over the past three months. I mean, it's, it's revolutionized our view of the surveillance state in the United States. And it's not for lack of trying. The ACLU and EPIC and EFF and CDT have all filed uh, requests seeking information about exactly the types of authorities these programs turned out to be based on, and it took a whistleblower uh, to make it possible for us to have access to all of this information, which of course just highlights the importance of the second session that we're going to be hearing about today. Um, and just to follow up on one thing that Mr. Rotenberg mentioned, I, I certainly agree that it is unlikely that the work of any of the domestic U.S. civil society organizations will substantially improve the conditions for privacy of people overseas. Um, but that, I think, is uh, in part at least a product of the lack of tools available to us because U.S. law, of course, is primarily geared towards protecting U.S. persons and we have to work with what we have and in that respect we don't have a lot. Thank you very much. That brings us to the second round of questions. Um, I have five requests for the floor. Maybe I can also ask you when you answer the second round of questions to come back to what I ask about evidence of results or abuse of, of data. But uh, I have on my list Mrs. Morvai, Mrs. Sippel, Mr. Bronze, Mr. Weidenholzer, and Mrs. Ludford. Anybody else wants to take the floor. No, then I close the list. Mrs. Morvai has the floor. Uh, maximum two minutes, please. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, my question in Hungarian uh, because uh, we uh, seem to have won in an unhealthy uh, competition against the uh, United States because uh, when we held a hearing about uh, violations of rights in Hungary, there were a lot more uh, people present at that hearing, and I am surprised uh, how few people are here. Uh, when uh, we had the Tavares hearing, we didn't have empty chairs like this. Mr. Tavares himself is absent, even though he is, he fences himself as a big freedom fighter. Uh, my question is, why do you think um, is there there is this this lack of interest in in these uh, in these breaches of uh, of of uh, legality um, and these illegal activities that the United States is uh, responsible for? Um, is this some kind of a Orwellian 1984 uh, scenario? What is the what is the what is behind? this huge collection of data. Why is the U.S. government collecting data on Europeans and on its own citizens? What they tell us 
uh, of course it's a lie, is that they need this data uh, in their fight against terrorism. Every right-thinking person knows that this is a lie, uh, otherwise they wouldn't be listening on in conversations of the president of Brazil and uh, wouldn't have been listening on conversations at the UN headquarters and wouldn't be collecting uh, medical as well as banking uh, secrets about uh, people. So if, uh, if, it was about, if, it, if it was about terrorism, then uh, they would stop the wars that actually contribute to terrorism. So what is, to your knowledge, the purpose of uh, this uh, collection of data? Why are they, what, they, what, what, they, what do they want to use this data uh, for? Um, uh, my third question, last question, uh, the ACLU and other, other uh, NGOs, how are you going to... <laughs> How are you going to, to protect Mr. Snowden? And my third question is, who will protect the rights and the, the interests of Mr. Snowden in the United Mrs. States and Mrs. in Mrs. Europe? Morvai, Thank you. I'm going to invite the next speaker, Mrs. Zippel, for two minutes, please. Thank you very much. I will try to make it short. I'm very happy to hear even from U.S. civil society that there is a debate on all the collection of data this is going much too far, even after the experience of 9-11, and to hear talking about the lack of protection of data and uh, privacy. My question is, if you tell, talk now about some reactions from government, maybe taking back some measures, at least concerning U.S. citizens. Is this something that is happening because the government is recognizing that they went maybe much too far, or is it only an announcement from your point of view as far as you can uh, talk about it? Or is it just an announcement to finish the debate? And uh, coming from that, I would like to know if you would have any idea how to uh, lead the debate between European Union and the United States. And I agree with uh, Mark Rotenberg that going on the same way as if nothing has happened with the negotiations between Europe and the United States will change nothing. Because if I understood you correctly, yes, citizens in the United States are happy if surveillance of their own per people will, be st will stop, but they have no problem with the surveillance of EU citizens. So what can we do to have a debate on this? And I very much agree uh, on what Mr. Rotterbeck said. The only chance is to stop agreements because uh, the interest of TTIP and others is not only on Europe, it's also on the U.S. So, but if you have any other ideas how we can keep on to have a debate here in Europe, but even between European Union civil societies and your organizations, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Mr. Bronze. Thank you. Um, how does the NSA extract the information from this mass of data? I'm not casting doubt on the, for, uh, uh, the, the facts, but uh, do they identify a list of persons and organizations and extract it from those, or do they look at it at random? They must have an army of people engaged in this. Um, <clears throat> to what extent are American citizens disadvantaged by casual non-political contact with people in whom the NSA is interested. I'm sure that members of the suspect class wouldn't want to um, affect adversely innocent contacts. How's the information used? Is it just collected as information or do they take action possibly of an illegal form? <clears throat> uh, how wide is the debate in the United States progressing? Who's driving the push for continued surveillance? Which interests or lobbyists uh, are obstructing the interests of privacy? Do any of these have connections with foreign states? Indeed, is the data ever transferred to third countries? Mr. Bowden made a, or Bowden made a very interesting point last week. Uh, he said that the, point, the problem of surveillance wasn't just its use, as indeed I'd suggested, but that the effect of the knowledge of surveillance might have the effect of inhibiting activism or even people from being inquisitive and going on to websites. Possibly that's a hidden purpose. Um, I think that I understood Mr. Uh, Rottenberg correctly that the security services don't always see themselves as being bound by privacy laws in the way that the rest of us are. Uh, the implication, of course, is that whatever legal changes you 
succeed in getting uh, done uh, will have little effect. Um, just a final point with regard to attendance here, I'm sure that it would have been higher if the meeting on the 24th, the meeting today, and the meeting scheduled for Thursday had been held on one day. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not in, in charge of that, um, and I'm, I don't think that we're, uh, that we're short on meetings. Mr. Weidenholzer. Thank you, Shin. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank you for the extensive information and the fact that you've told us that apparently in the United States discussions are actually bearing fruit, helping people to solve problems. So in some cases, you'll end up with a situation in the U.S. being improved, unlike here in Europe. Now. I'd particularly be interested uh, to know about uh, cooperation between the U.S. and uh, Europe. I'm convinced that it needs to be close uh, amongst civil society and also members of parliament. And as for my question, how are we perceived in the USA? Are we perceived at all? Or what should we do, really, uh, for the U.S. to perceive us and take us seriously? I think uh, we do need to take steps because the, I'm not convinced otherwise if we do nothing that uh, we'll get the sort of uh, outcome we want. Speaker on my list, Mrs. Lutford. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I also would like to, to thank um, Mark and, and Catherine, as usual, um, uh, for their assistance. We get a lot of help from EPIC and uh, ACLU, and indeed that's one of the main reasons. I, I, you know, I think it would be silly to cut ourselves off, uh, you know, Europe and, and, and the United States, because I, I think there's so many common interests here. For me, the issue is not about Europe against America. It's about the citizen largely against the state, as well as um, other uh, data uh, controllers. And I think, um, you know, we need to try and find ways of, of smart pressure on both uh, governments uh, and on business. And, of course, it's not just the NSA. As I keep being reminded in the last three months, it's also about the uh, British uh, GCHQ uh, and, indeed, the French. Uh, let's not anyone be hypocritical around here. Um, and uh, so, you know, we have a European domestic uh, problem on uh, overreach of uh, surveillance uh, by the intelligence agencies. So, you know, I, I, it's going to be a difficult process to manage how we best put pressure while not shooting ourselves in the foot. Personally, I regard the suspension of the um, TTIP negotiations as completely shooting ourselves in the foot. I think we need to take opportunities. You know, it's about hugging each other closer, almost, um, and, and finding, as they say, clever ways, and I think one of it is through uh, business and their interest in the data protection regulation to try and get the solutions we want, including by convincing uh, Congress. Uh, certainly, uh, Sophie Innitveld and myself have had past experience of the uh, chairwoman of the Sen Senate Intelligence uh, Committee who was not too bothered about um, foreigners and being victims of rendition and torture. Um, so I don't particularly look in that direction. But, um, you know, I, I just think that we've got to try and pull together here uh, because, uh, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't see a solution otherwise. I just wanted specifically to ask Mark, um, you talked about seeking from Congress changes to, um, to get Privacy Act legal safeguards for Europeans, but that hasn't particularly helped Americans in this NSA environment. The Privacy Act hasn't Can been of total help to Americans, has it? Okay. Those were all the questions. Um, maybe I'll take the answers in the inverse order. Maybe Ms. Crump would like to start. 
Thank you. So there were a number of questions. I'll jump in on some of them, and Mark, I assume, will we'll get to the rest. Um, there was one question about uh, Snowden and, uh, you know, what, if any, preparations are being made for him and uh, to aid him in the United States. Um, the ACLU has already stated publicly uh, that we're tremendously grateful for his uh, contributions to public understanding about these programs and, in fact, are uh, prepared, if uh, necessary, to coordinate any defense uh, that would be needed uh, should it ultimately come to that in the United States. Um, there are a series of questions about how the NSA extracts various types of data. Um, you know, and it really varies from program to program. Certain programs involve, uh, clearly involve mass collection, just undifferentiated access to data. Others uh, involve sort of swaths of data, for example, all communications into and out of a particular region or country. Um, and so it's sort of hard to give a, a global answer to that, um, but hopefully the forthcoming revelations from, from Mr. Snowden and um, as we've also started to see more and more people within the administration talking and leading to stories that aren't necessarily even based on his documents, we'll, we'll have more information there. Um, you know, we are concerned, there was a question about the chilling effect of surveillance. Um, that is something we're particularly concerned about. It's uh, in part the basis of the ACLU's legal claim and its challenge to the uh, mass call logging program because we're fearful that people uh, won't uh, be willing to speak with organizations such as the ACLU um, if they know that their uh, communications will be monitored by the government. Uh, by the way, I should also mention that um, in my capacity at the ACLU, I speak with new numerous reporters, and over the past four months, I've never, um, I've never previously encountered so many reporters um, just sort of spontaneously mention how fearful they were in reporting on uh, topics related to the NSA. It, it, started, it started before the Snowden revelations, really, when um, there were um, it, when it became clear that certain AP reporters were having their electronic communications um, monitored, um, but, 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 but people have you know, spoken pointedly about their fear that reporting on these uh, programs may lead to extra scrutiny of, of their own lives. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons we're all particularly grateful for those reporters who, who do uh, report on these topics. Um, you know, there, there are sort of a limited number of reporters who have access to these troves of documents and, and figuring out how to handle them also often in isolation without a lot of uh, institutional support um, can't, be an easy, can't be an easy job. Um, so, uh, there was a question about evidence of abuse or results from this data. I think that's one of the thorniest questions. Um, it, it's particularly thorny because those of us on the outside of government simply often don't have access to information regarding how the data has been used. Um, the administration sometimes offers anecdotal evidence or, you know, bald assertions that particular surveillance authorities were crucial in undermining particular terrorist activities. Uh, and then you raise questions about whether that same information would have been available through other sources and the answers, uh, you know, either the answers are sometimes that they would have been or the answers are unclear. Um, and I think uh, we in the United States are very dependent on a few members of Congress, Wyden and Udall in particular, who, um, you know, do have access to information that the public is not privy to and um, have uh, raised questions in, uh, about the efficacy of some of these programs, uh, in particular the mass uh, call logging program and whether it has in fact advanced uh, security. And when one uh, considers proportionality uh, in a context of a program that involves collection of de telephone data about absolutely everyone, that is obviously an essential piece of information. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll let Mark handle the rest if he's willing. Thank you. Well, regarding Mr. Snowden, I was just uh, passed a note by my uh, colleague and friend and a civil liberties hero in the United States, Jesslyn Raddick, who um, is on the next panel and she'll be reading a statement from Mr. Snowden, so I think you'll want to stay uh, for, for the next panel. Uh, Ms. Morvai um, asked this critical question, why collect data? Why is the data being collected? And let me provide, you know, my view. Data that's collected in public contributes to public knowledge, and it's a wonderful thing. Data that's collected in secret is used to gain power and control. And that is the reason that modern democratic governments are so concerned about the secretive collection of data. It's about power and control. Um, Ms. Sippel asked, um, 
why are things changing in the U.S.? And I think part of the answer is that we do have a genuine public dialogue, but part of the answer, interestingly, is that the White House is also hearing from leaders here in Europe, and there is clearly concern being expressed between governments about the consequences of listening in on the communications of diplomats and of trade negotiators and of other government officials. Uh, there is a level beyond which I think even people in high public office believes uh, that government should not go. And that has also contributed, I believe, to the, to the U.S. Uh, response. Um, Mr. Bronce asked a whole series of very good questions about what is it exactly that the NSA is doing. We're all trying to find out. Um, my organization, epic.org, has a lot of resources. Catherine's, ACLU.org. Uh, we also at the Georgetown University Law Center doing a series of conferences this year trying to get a better picture. To me, among the most revealing documents have been not only the orders setting out the legal authority, but the judicial opinions now released by the courts on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which actually provide a lot of detail about how these programs have been undertaken and have also, according to the courts, uncovered violations, violations of statute, violations of constitutional law. That's worth um, looking at. Um, Mr. Weidenholzer asks, how are we perceived in the U.S., at least to the extent that there are international concerns here? And again, I think the U.S. public um, still doesn't think about the global dimension of NSA surveillance. I mean, we see that the president of Brazil chose recently not to meet with Obama over this issue. We know that, you know, Mrs. Merkel's opponent raised this issue in the German elections. But I think most people still are not aware of it, which is why I think you will continue to need to make it an issue. Um, you know, Ms. Ludford makes, uh, as always, a very good and practical point. I mean, you have to be careful about some of these political battles. You don't want to give up other things that are valuable to you, and I fully respect that. But I, you know, wrote recently about U.S.-German relations in light of the data protection concerns that have been raised. And one line that I included in, in, in my letter, which people liked, was simply this. You know, friends don't spy on friends, right? I mean... There is a difference. There is a difference between investigating spies and people who pose a threat to your nation and just routinely gathering data about your allies and your friends and your colleagues. And I think the U.S. has crossed that line. Thank you very much. You indeed think that you only spy on potential suspects to potential threats to your national security. I really don't feel like a threat to your national security. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Um, thank you both very much for your contributions. Um, I'm, I'm sure that this committee will uh, remain in contact, and uh, I hope that we can put any further questions to you that may come up in the, um, the course of the inquiry. So thank you both very much. Um, before we go to the, the next session, I would just like to stress um, uh, to this committee that the, the U.S. authorities have been invited to, uh, to give evidence to this committee, um, but they have declined. We've received a couple of letters saying that, uh, and I quote, um, they say, we regret that we cannot offer any encouragement for official U.S. participation. Um, we've also, uh, for the, the, the previous session, we had invited the Dutch authorities, which have equally declined. We have invited the UK authorities for a future session, and we are still waiting for a reply. So if anybody would want to criticize the, um, let's say, the, the, the composition and the balance uh, of these hearings, uh, they should know that everybody has been invited, all sides have been invited to give evidence, um, but they have um, declined. Mrs. Morfa, you have a point of order? Yes, yes, I would like to ask for the copies of those letters. Maybe it would be good for all of us to have them because we might like to share it with our constituencies. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm pretty sure they can be circulated by the, the Secretariat. I don't think they're secret. There are many secrets, but this is not secret. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, invite the next panel of speakers to uh, take their seats on the podium. Um, the next session is dedicated to whistleblowers, their activities on the one hand and their legal protection on the other hand, because as has been pointed out during this panel, their role is vital if the, uh, the legal instruments for transparency that we have do not uh, fully, do, do not work properly. We're going to listen to three testimonies, um, first by Mr. Drake, who is a former NSA senior executive. Uh, then we will listen by video conference to the testimony of Mr. Wiebe, who is also a former NSA senior analyst, uh, and he will join us through video conferencing from Washington. And finally, we're going to listen to Ms. Uh, Annie Macken, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who is a former MI5 intelligence officer. Can I invite you all to the podium? Hello. Okay. Sorry. I was instructed wrong. I tried to get it right. Sorry. Okay. We're going to uh, ask each of you to, uh, to do a 15 minute presentation and because of the video conference I'm going to ask um, you all to, to, to really stick to that time otherwise it becomes really really complicated technically so uh, very welcome to our committee uh, I'm going to invite Mr. Drake to kick off the debate you have the floor for 15 minutes thank you to the European Parliament and the Civil Liberties Justice and Home Affairs Committee for inviting me to speak before your critically important public hearings and the challenge you collectively face regarding the National Security Agency surveillance programs and their impact on your respective member countries as well as the privacy of citizens in my country and yours the fundamental issue before your committee is a foreign government often in league with the intelligence apparatus of other countries as well as cooperating internet phone and data service providers spying on you and your citizens under the guise of protecting its own interests in the name of national security, a convenient constraint of monitoring control, especially con conducted in secret outside the purview of law and public debate excuse, while excuse subverting me, your can sovereignty. I, can I interrupt you just for one second? The interpreters ask you to slow down a little bit, otherwise they can't keep up. <laughs> I used to fly as a crypto-linguist on RC-135 reconnaissance aircraft in the greater European theater during the latter years of the Cold War. My primary target of interest was East Germany. The Stasi became monstrously efficient using surveillance to enable their pathological need to know everything, their very operating motto. However, I never imagined that the U.S. would use the Stasi playbook as a template for its own state-sponsored surveillance regime and turning not only its own citizens into virtual persons of interest, but also millions of citizens in the rest of the world. Do we really want to become subject to and subjects of a secret surveillance state? In a surveillance state, everybody is suspicious and laws protecting privacy and citizen sovereignty are regarded as inconvenient truths bypassed in the name of keeping the rest of us safe and secure as justification for the wanton and surreptitious bulk copy collection and unbridled access to vast, vast amounts of data about our lives. Unfortunately, this surveillance regime has now grown into a globe-girdling system that has gone far beyond prosecuting terrorism and other international crimes and wrongdoing. Your committee faces the challenge of dealing with a secret hidden shadow surveillance state dissolving the very heart of freedom and liberty and our respective citizen rights and using this power to expand sovereign free zones. Even when it undermines the very fabric of society, breaks trust between nations and endangers the very mechanisms we use for commerce and trade. This exceptionalism gives rise to an ends justifying the means mentality and violating the sovereignty of other nations and citizens far beyond the real threats we do face from those who would cause us real harm, but often exaggerating those very threats in public for access to all of our data behind the scenes. When national security services are more than willing to deliberately compromise the very information technology services and protocols 
that so many citizens as well as commercial and private enterprises rely upon and enjoy for legitimate confidentiality, data protection, and security in order to conduct their day-to-day -day business, it becomes very difficult to maintain trust in those systems. Nothing less, nothing less than the very sovereignty of our citizens and states are at stake in the face of an unfettered surveillance state apparatus. From the recent disclosures of Edward Snowden, the U.S. government has routinely violated on a vast industrial scale the constitutional protections afforded its own citizens while dis also disregarding the internal integrity of other states and the fundamental rights of non-U.S. citizens. I know because I was eyewitness to the very foundations of a persistent surveillance state expanded in the deepest of secrecy right after 9-11. I was there at the beginning. While a senior official at the National Security Agency, I found out about the use of a top secret domestic electronic eavesdropping program that collected and accessed vast amounts of digital data, including phone numbers, email addresses, financial transactions, and more turn the U.S. in the equivalent of a foreign nation for the purposes of blanket dragnet surveillance and data mining, blatantly abandoning and unchaining itself from the Constitution and a 23-year legal regime enacted due to earlier violations of citizen rights by U.S. government's use and abuse of national instruments of power against Americans in the 60s and 70s. These secret surveillance programs were born during the first few critical weeks and months following 9-11 as a result of willful decisions made by the highest levels of the U.S. government. Such shortcuts and end runs were not necessary as lawful alternatives existed that would have vastly improved U.S. intelligence capability with the best of American ingenuity and innovation while fundamentally protecting the privacy of citizens at the same time. I raised the gravest of concerns through internal channels, spoke directly with NSA Office of General Counsel, and then became a material witness and whistleblower for two 9-11 congressional investigations in 2002, and then exposing massive fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement at NSA during a multi-year Department of Defense Office of Inspector General audit from 2003 to 2005 regarding a multi-billion dollar NSA flagship intelligence collection program under development that was far more costly and far less effective in supporting critical intelligence requirements than a readily available and privacy protecting alternative. I followed all the rules as a whistleblower until it fundamentally conflicted with my oath to uphold and defend the Constitution and made a fateful choice in 2006 to exercise my First Amendment rights and went to the press with critical information about which the public had a right to know regarding the fraud, waste, and abuse, as well as the secret and unconstitutional surveillance programs. However, rather than address the illegality and wrongdoing, the government made me a target of a huge federal criminal leak investigation into the exposure of the secret surveillance programs and subjected me to severe retaliation, reprisal, and retribution that started with forcing me out from my job as a career public servant. I was subsequently blacklisted, no longer had a stream of income, while simultaneously incurring substantial attorney fees and other huge costs, necessitating a second mortgage in my house, the emptying of my bank accounts, including retirement and savings. And that was just the beginning. What I experienced as a whistleblower sends the most chilling of messages about what the government can, and I will emphasize, will do when one speaks truth to and of power, a direct form of political repression and censorship. And yet, once exposed, these unconstitutional detours were and still are predictably justified by often vague and undefined claims of national security, while aided and abetted by shameless fear-mongering on the part of the government. And yet, we are now in an era where sharing issues of significant concern in the public interest, which do not in any way compromise national security, 
are often now considered criminal acts of espionage aided and abetted by reporters and the press, yet anathema to a free, open, and democratic society. I did everything I could to defend the inalienable rights of all U.S. citizens and the sovereignty of the individual, which were so egregiously violated and abused by my own government when there was no reason to do so at all, except as an excuse to go to the proverbial dark side by exercising unaccountable, irresponsible, and off-the-books unilateral executive power in secret. I blew the whistle because I saw grave injustice, illegality, and wrongdoing occurring within the National Security Agency. I was subsequently placed under intense physical and electronic surveillance, raided by the FBI in 2007, and two and a half years later, under the Obama administration, criminally charged under a 10 felony count indictment, including five under the Espionage Act, facing 35 years in prison. The extraordinary charges that were leveled against me by the U.S. Department of Justice are symptomatic of the rising power of the national security state since 9-11 and a direct assault on freedom of speech, thought, innovation, and privacy. The government found out everything they could about me and turned me into an enemy of the state. I became the first whistleblower prosecuted in the decades since Daniel Ellsberg under the draconian World War I era Espionage Act, a law meant to go after spies, not whistleblowers. Having the secret ability to collect and analyze data with few, if any, substantial constraints, especially on people, is seductively powerful, and when done without the person's permission and in secret against their will, is the ultimate form of control over others. When government surveillance of this magnitude hides behind the veil of secrecy, when it professes openness and transparency while practicing opaqueness and deceit, that's when citizens need to become very aware and wary of what the future might hold, when their very liberties are eroded and even taken away in the name of national security without their consent. The fear engendered through the invocation of threats, real and imagined, creates a climate where rights are ignored as a unifying cause for obsessing over national security and the use of fear by the government to control the public and private agenda. My criminal case is direct evidence of an out-of-control and off-the-books government that is increasingly alien to the Constitution and a democracy at home and abroad. The rise in this form of a contrary alien form of government, assuming the shape of a national security state under surveillance, evidences the all-too-distinct and historically familiar characteristics of an alarming soft tyranny as an anathema to all forms of democracy. As Montesquieu wrote, quote, no tyranny is more cruel than that which is practiced in the shadow of the law and with the trappings of justice. That is, one would drown the unfortunate by the very plank by which he would hope to be saved. One could make the case that the government to make me and others targets as part of a much broader campaign against whistleblowers in order to send the strongest possible message about what the government can and will do to suppress dissent and speech it doesn't like. And yet the United States' brutal and unrelenting crackdown on whistleblowers is outdone by the magnitude of what is now trying to hide or continue as a result of the Snowden disclosures. NSA is not just eavesdropping on all Americans and building architecture for a police state in the U.S. It has created the largest set of mass surveillance programs in the history of the world, while covertly weakening Internet security and privacy for everyone on the planet. Without privacy and robust data protections under the law, no real individual citizen sovereignty within a state and society is possible. NSA is doing this deliberately, systematically and in secret. Even if we take NSA at its word, its intention to only target persons suspected of terrorism as it relates to foreign intelligence, they're clearly not collecting and storing as much of our communications as possible. NSA has inverted and perverted the heart of the democratic paradigm in which the government acts in public and our personal lives are private. Now everyone's personal and private lives and associated transaction and data history becomes the equivalent of secret government property held for years as pre-crime data, just in case it is needed in the future. Secret dossiers of the state, while attempts to expose the government, are met with a heavy hand of criminal prosecution. The words of U.S. Senator Frank Church during the hearings he conducted on the abuses of national security in the 1970s are worthy of reminding us 
of what can happen when a state-sponsored surveillance regime is used as the excuse to keep us safe at the expense of liberty and freedom. If a dictator ever took charge in this country, the technological capacity that the intelligence community has given the government could enable it to impose total tyranny, and there would be no way to fight back because of the most careful effort to combine together in resistance to the government, no matter how privately it was done, is within the reach of government to know such is the capacity of technology. People in America and around the world should not have to worry about protecting themselves from an unhinged United States government, unchanged from its own constitution, but worry they must. And the government should not, under the guise of protecting its own citizenry, conduct mass dragnet surveillance in secret, let alone the rest of the entire world, while publicly crushing anyone who tries to expose it. I respectfully suggest that your committee duly examine the critical need of transparency and legal accountability to enforce fundamental and vitally precious citizen rights to speech and association while protecting those who expose government malfeasance and wrongdoing, as well as providing for robust protections against unwarranted search and seizure by any foreign power, state surveillance agency, or corporate entity. I hope that your committee will consider a European Union-wide law that all EU to EU internet links and nodes must be encrypted with open source encryption technology made available for the widest possible use wherever practical while also audited by the EU. What we see now revealed on a global scale creates the power of mass surveillance and eludes effective control by current data and privacy protection regulations. How do your member states protect themselves from the predations of the surveillance regime? There's a distinct need for policies that prohibit third-party countries and commercial concerns from accessing and compromising personal data, while also covering vendors and suppliers of IT systems and products. There also needs to be put in place the power to prosecute and hold accountable those transnational companies and entities from secretly compromising the very infrastructure that society depends on for business and trade. Prism proofing is your member state, your member state internet hosting and service providers is now critical given how data is not so much broken as it is taken and renditioned by the surveillance state. It is the constant possibility of the unequal gaze and reality of surveillance and observation, real or imagined. Excuse, excuse me, Mr. Drake, the interpreters are asking you to slow down. Can I also ask you to come to a conclusion? Yeah. We have the video link waiting. Yeah. I fundamentally reject the dystopian premise given what happened to me. In conclusion, I was fortunate that I did not end up in an actual prison for coming out of the system and speaking truth to and of power, a dangerous act of civil disobedience, individuality for sure in these times. The last thing a free and open society needs is a digital fence around us with the bob wire of surveillance not only keeping track of our comings and goings, yet now increasingly wanting to know what we think and feel, the very essence of who we are and share as human beings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for that statement. Um, now we have a, a video link with Mr. Wiebe, who is a former and is a senior analyst and who joins us from Washington. So very welcome. Can you hear us? Good afternoon to Europe. Hello. Are you Mr. Here? Okay. <coughs> Mr. Aguilar, members of the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice, and Home Affairs of the European Parliament, greetings from Washington. It is true and an honor to appear before you today on privacy matters of extreme importance to all civilized nations, nations who believe the law constitutes the only true nonviolent protection for freedom-loving people everywhere. It saddens me deeply to say that here in the United States, certain individuals played important roles in changing the U.S. Constitution in ways that have not been seen in a century or more. I refer to the Fourth Amendment that protects the privacy of all American citizens. While the Fourth Amendment demands that conditions of probable cause exist in order to demonstrate why a person's privacy rights should be violated, NSA slowly began to change the very meaning of that important language when the former director of NSA, Michael Hayden, stated that the operative language in the Fourth Amendment was not probable cause, but reasonable suspicion. Hayden made this distinction to free NSA from stringent prohibitions 
so that it could have a freer hand in judging what might be of intelligence interest in the wake of the tragic events of September 11, 2001. The tentacles of NSA surveillance have been growing ever since, aided and abetted by a U.S. Congress, a Congress more eager to say yes in the name of national security than to perform its oversight duties in the name of the U.S. Constitution. Indeed, NSA's vague technical explanations only created further confusion and Congress capitulated. When it was later revealed that the NSA was collecting information on Americans, NSA claimed the violation was accidental. However, we now know, thanks to Edward Snowden, that this assertion was patently false. When the news broke about NSA's invasion of privacy, two former and very highly respected directors of NSA, retired Army General William Odom and retired Vice Admiral Bobby Inman, commented sharply on the matter. And I both quote and paraphrase from the relevant news article. Should have been court-martialed was the judgment of the late General Bill Odom about Hayden. And President Bush should be impeached, added Odom with equal fury. Odom ruled out discussing the warrantless eavesdropping that had been revealed by the New York Times just a few weeks earlier. In a memorandum about the conversation, the reporter, Mr. Kenny, opined that Odom appeared so angry that he realized that if he started discussing the still classified issue, he would not be able to control himself. Why was General Odom so angry? Because he, like all uniformed officers of the military, took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Because he took that oath seriously and because as the head of the National Security Agency, he did his best to ensure that all employees strictly observed NSA's first commandment, thou shalt not eavesdrop on Americans without a court warrant. Also disappointed was former NSA Director Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, who was one of the country's most highly respected senior managers of intelligence and an author of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. Inman took strong issue with Hayden's disregard of the law. And I quote, there clearly was a line in the law which says you couldn't do this, said Inman. You can't do anything that is not authorized. Inman spoke proudly of the earlier ethos at NSA, where it was deeply ingrained that you operate within the law and you get the law changed if you need to. Hayden did not seek to change the law, but instead had it reinterpreted by lawyers within the United States Department of Justice, not by the U.S. Supreme Court, and certainly not with the permission of the American people. I would now like to quickly demonstrate, through the visual aid of a few PowerPoint slides, that, with the help of today's technology, there is absolutely no need to balance security and liberty. There is no reason to sacrifice one iota of liberty in order to obtain security through the analysis of what is commonly called big data. The first slide is a definition of content. As you know, this debate about electronic surveillance involves two categories of information, metadata and content. Just take a brief moment to read a few of these examples. All right, Ms. could we Ms. have the metadata Ms. slide, Mr. please? Mr. Lieber, can I, can I briefly interrupt? I think yes, you, yes. It's the, the, the presentation we get here has it been circulated? Yes, and it's in your files because it's difficult for us to read from the screen, but I'm, I'm just telling my colleagues here, it's in your files. It's in front of you on your, on your desk. Okay, so you can read along. 
Sorry if interrupted. Okay, so, so I will go ahead and just mention a few examples of content uh, for your committee. Um, uh, content would be the content of a Microsoft Word document, for example, or the body of an email, or the content of a telephone call. Those are examples of content. Whereas metadata are descriptors of content. For example, when you make a phone call, you use a telephone number. The telephone number that you are calling from and the recipient's phone number are examples of metadata. We call this kind of data addressing. Uh, just like you have an email address, you probably have a, an identity or an address uh, in Twitter or Facebook or whatever it may be. These are addresses and these are typically metadata. Subject lines of emails which describe content within the email are metadata. Uh, all names of people's places and things are metadata. Account numbers, license plate numbers are metadata. Information describing photographs the title of the photograph, how big the photograph is in pixels, inches, or sonometers. These are examples of metadata. If we could move, please, to the next uh, view graph, which should be tracking Bob. Do we have the one that says, tra yeah, you had it, that's it. I want to give you examples of the threat. In this country, the United States, Content may not be revealed without a court order. However, metadata is open to inspection by anyone according to U.S. law. The threat is that with metadata, every time a human being touches an electronic information system, they leave a marker, they leave an imprint, and those imprints are records that can be collected by those who wish to do electronic surveillance. And they can be aligned in time so that as you interface with information systems, the record can be placed against a calendar and a clock to see what you were doing when you interfaced with each of those electronic systems. Tracking Bob begins around 6 in the morning and ends at about 10.37 at night. And you can see the examples of the kinds of electronic transaction that he participates in and the records that it leaves. We can move to the slide of illegal use of private information. It's uh, entitled U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency Special Ops Division. This item is very new. You may have not seen it. Um, the slides I have show two depictions of rules being followed by this organization. Um, and, and what it essentially shows is that NSA information is being used by other U.S. government agencies to uh, pursue their responsibilities. In this case, obviously, U.S. Drug Enforcement is interested in criminal activity in, involving the use or transmittal or selling of drugs and the like. The bothersome part of this, if you'll go to the second slide, illegal use of private information, the Special Operations Division is masking, covering up, if you will, the source of the information. Now what this does for someone who has been indicted or prosecuted by the U.S. legal system is to remove any hope of facing one's accusers in a court of law because the person will never find out that the information came from NSA. So this special division of DEA is told to cover up the source to make it look like the data came out of a typical uh, investigation uh, by law enforcement, perhaps the FBI or someone else. The authority for the mass collection of telephone metadata in the United States comes from a Supreme Court case, Smith versus Maryland from 1979. 
I raise this case because it is upon this ruling that the entire U.S. surveillance structure is resting its case, demanding that it have free access to metadata of every sort. In this particular case, it involved a thief and his victim. The thief called his victim to harass her. The police installed a recording device that recorded the fact that he had made this phone call and used that evidence in court to prove that he was the committer of the crime and the person doing the harassment via electronic means. The government says the single use of metadata then allows the government to collect metadata en masse. This is a leap of logic that I frankly cannot share in and most people with whom I speak cannot share in either. This matter has yet to be tested in court. In 1979, no judge could have envisioned that our whole world, our daily lives would be permeated with the use of electronic devices, electronic transactions, toll road transponders, bank account transactions, credit card usage, and the like. The Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, and I read to you this important language because it's not long, but it's important for your deliberations. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. This is the standard, and I do not know European law, but I would assume that many of your own privacy laws read very much the same. It requires factual information that is that defines a suspect in a criminal investigation, not just a guess or some non-scientific research. The final graph that I want to show you is entitled Focus of Analysis, One Degree and Two Degrees of Separation. Electronic transactions and computer systems are the threat to privacy, but I would argue the same tools are useful to guarantee privacy. Analysis can be conducted without ever breaking the rules governing the privacy of the individual. In the example on this particular slide, I have one person named John Doe resides in Chula Vista, California. He is a known bad person. He's a criminal or a terrorist or something of that nature. He has contacts with another entity that is colored in yellow. Yellow dots in this graph are suspects. They have not been proven to be guilty of anything. Their information, those in yellow, the ones with him whom he is speaking or communicating with, are protected with encryption. Now, this technique allows them to be represented in this visual depiction. They're in a relationship, but there is no identifying data, just a unique one-up numbering system or some other nomenclature used to provide a unique identity without disclosing the private information of the actual persons. This is eminently doable in software. There is no need to expose intelligence analysts to the identifications of innocent people. In this example, the intelligence analysts would continue to watch and monitor the content and the metadata associated with John Doe. If there arose content or some metadata activity indicating uh, the guilt or the probable guilt of the yellow dot with whom he is communicating, then that information would be submitted to a court for approval to get the permission to uncover the identity of those yellow dots that are involved. Now, 
I want you to please understand, this does not necessarily mean that you convene literally a court. Many of the criteria that the court would define as probable cause for unveiling an identity could be defined in software, in a computer system. We call it commonly a business rule or a set of business rules, such that the court process defined by the court, the criteria defined by the court, could then be played against the data that a surveillance agency authorized to do this kind of work, and the decision could be made automatically, virtually in microseconds, certainly not longer than seconds, if this kind of technique were used. So this type of Mr. encrypted Mr. Uh, protect okay. innocent people protects the innocent. Okay. I and that apologize is my for interrupting you. Can, can you hear me? But we have to come to a conclusion. Yes. Because people also want to and ask that, And questions. I am finished. I have the uh, ungrateful yes. task of uh, keeping an eye on, on the clock. So if you could please wind up and then maybe we can, can address some elements uh, in, in the question and answer. Uh, very timely because that was my final comment. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I feel embarrassed now. Okay, we're, uh, colleagues, I, I propose that uh, for, we put our questions um, to Mr. Wiebe immediately rather than at the end of the session because we are having this video link. I also suggest that um, we limit the questions to the, the rapporteur and the shadow rapporteurs because I think Mrs. Morvai asked the floor um, for a question to Mr. Drake, if that is okay with everybody. Mr. Moraes? No questions? Okay, then we come to Mr. Voss from the EPP group. I believe the questions will come to you in English. If there is a problem, then please signal. Okay, thank you. So, may I ask in German or in English? Yeah. I've got a question. You were talking about evaluating the data and the collection of data. This is a fact-finding exercise. And so I'm interested to hear whether the evaluation of the data was just to do with risks or was it a general evaluation of data, including economic and other data? I think uh, we take it one question at a time. Can you answer this question? Y yes. Um, in the United States, the NSA Charter permits it to investigate intelligence questions of virtually any kind as long as the focus is against foreign targets, foreign to the United States. That is pretty much the charter. How that charter is fine-tuned in, in, in reality, then, is a matter of separate agreements with member nations uh, it, uh, around the globe. And some of those relations are tempered by partnerships with surveillance organizations among um, resident in those nations, and some are not. And uh, there are different um, agreements and different uh, breadth uh, in terms of uh, broad sharing or narrow sharing depends on those agreements. Okay, thank you very much. The next question by Mr. Albrecht from the Greens. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to know um, to what extent uh, did you envisage blanket retention of metadata uh, and how do you think this was extended also to the access to databases by companies abroad uh, by the NSA? Yeah, um, excellent question, and let me answer in this way. In today's world, where data resides is not so much the issue, because as long as it's connected to the global network, the web, the World Wide Web in some way, it is accessible by an organization or an agency. The only thing preventing that access are access, uh, uh, protocol accesses in software and, and protected gateways and perhaps encryption. This is why I would say to protect data wherever it is, it should be highly encrypted 
And the key to decrypt the data should not be in the hands of the intelligence surveillance organizations. It should be in the hands of uh, a court of justice or some neutral body uh, that ensures that the decrypt uh, algorithms are not available to anyone for use uh, as they see or, or so desire. So is it preferable that the data be protected in a friendly place? Yes. But it is still open to hacking um, or uh, invasion through some other technique. So encryption is really the, the, the barrier that must be used to do this. I, um, I, in the technique that I have shown you in this last view graph with the connect the dots, does not need retention of data uh, that is not associated with uh, criminal activity or terrorist activity. Uh, this could be okayed through a court and then the data could be retrieved on a case by case basis. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, operating schema that we would envision for this. Thank you. Um, the, there is nobody here on behalf of the ECR group. Then the GUI group is Ernst. Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Well, just very briefly, you said that sources are often hidden, hidden, so you often can't find out, for example, that the NSA is actually revealing its sources. So could you tell us a little bit more specifically about that and what the uh, effects of that uh, hiding of sources have for citizens? Um, yes. Uh, w when intelligence surveillance organizations are doing the job we all want them to do, it's not a problem. And we understand they must protect sources and methods. Those are the two things that must be protected to guard secrets, and that is the sources and the methods. However, when data is not used or is used outside the charter of the organization, and, and in the United States we have had a traditional barrier between intelligence and law enforcement, and that barrier was there on purpose so that we didn't have a larger police state uh, oppressing and misusing uh, data, uh, which I'm afraid is what we're seeing. We're seeing the advent of the uh, surveillance state, the police state, and a growing use of secret information across government agencies. So um, w we now have an example gathered by Reuters, and that's the one of the, there are two slides in your package uh, that talk about the Special Operations Division of the uh, D Drug Enforcement Agency that depict just the circumstance you're talking about. How that affects a citizen is when you go to court, you don't know that you are being accused using data that was not truly authorized by your own government to be used for that purpose. In other words, the government's operating outside the set of rules that you as a citizen have come to respect and are essentially a part of. Um, and so th this kind of secret usage is exactly the kind of um, threatening activity that will undermine or can undermine uh, many of our civil liberties in this area. Okay, thank you all. I'll, I'll allow one question from a non-shadow rapporteur, Mrs. Morvai, if you can be really, really brief. We're running out of time. Thanks very much. Mr. Weeb, as, a, as an ex-NSA senior analyst, what would be your response to those who say, okay, there is all this data collection going on, but we need it for the purposes of our national security. We want to fight terrorists with this uh, data collection. And question number two, I, uh, I'm being devil's advocate, obviously, but uh, I want to hear it from you. Uh, and the, the, the second question uh, uh, is, uh, to your knowledge, your knowledge. Uh, where, where was the data was you collected data. from people like Mr. Bob on your, uh, on your example slide? Uh, who used this uh, data and for what purpose? 
I mean, it's obvious that it was not used for anti-terrorist purposes. Who used all the data that was uh, uh, ordered from the NSA, and what was the purpose? Thank you very much. Sure. Um, you don't – an organization doing electronic surveillance for valid reasons does not need all the data. They potentially need access to some of the data wherever it is. Um, but again, it's based on probable cause. So the process is intended to crawl into the world of data, and I mean metadata and, and uh, content. Uh, the focus should always be on those entities closest to criminal activity where you don't know of a criminal and you're just simply looking for evidence of criminal activity, um, things like uh, jihadi websites, people involved in Islamic radicalization, um, people uh, discussing or talking about uh, the sale of narcotics and things of that nature on the web, data that can be searched readily and is open to the public. That's where you find starting points. But if you have a known starting point, as in my example uh, shown earlier, uh, you don't need all the data in the world to, to, to go after those few relationships uh, that that person has with the other entities in the world, and that should be the focus of your intelligence analysis. So I would, again, I say you don't need all the data first to succeed. You simply need the relevant data to one or two degrees of separation from the beginning point, in this case, uh, John Doe. That is the data that we need, nothing beyond. Now, you asked, where is the data for Bob? It could be resident with internet service providers, telephone companies. It could be out there um, in, in the world of commerce. Uh, think of the data that goes down the internet pipe, if you will. Uh, wherever that data is, it could be obtained through a court order, duly ruled upon by a uh, legal authority such as a judge, or through a set of software defined by a judge or a court of law. So again, you don't need to grab it all, put it in a huge database, and hope someday that you'll need it. Not necessary. Sorry, Mrs. Morf, I, I, I have one final, we're running out of time, we're running late, and I'd really like to put in a question myself on behalf of the Liberals, and then we'll get to the, to, uh, the next round. Um, so, uh, I, two questions, you mentioned ethos at the NSA, Mr. Drake mentioned the Constitution, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we hear something similar from Mrs. Marchand afterwards. I mean, you started working at the NSA assuming that you, you'd have a, a, you know, that you were working in a specific constitutional context. What happens, what made you feel that you should um, uh, go outside, criticize the NSA, blow the whistle, and can you say, what is the atmosphere like? Are other people having doubts? Do other people feel they want to criticize, and do they feel free, do, do they feel safe to do so? And my second question, you said the key to this decryption should be in the hands of courts, but surely you do not mean the FISA court, which obviously doesn't work. Yes. Um, f to your first question, <clears throat> uh, why did I criticize? Why did I become a whistleblower? I came a, uh, became a whistleblower for two reasons. I witnessed corruption and uh, mismanagement within the NSA on major intelligence production programs, uh, one of which was in the news and was called Trailblazer. It occurred during Michael Hayden's directorship at NSA. And we knew, a few of us in the building at the time, that it was going to fail because the premise that it was built upon was uh, poorly uh, thought through. Um, and so this often happens in large organizations where good ideas get trampled by popular ideas or ideas that are driven by other agendas, such as perhaps granting large contracts to major commercial interests. Um, and that is aided, aided and abetted by those in Congress who have connections to those business interests. 
So many of these corruption problems are caused by our own governments. Um, and the other reason I criticized was because Mr. Binney, my colleague, uh, received information that the uh, NSA was illegally um, uh, collecting and looking at uh, data that it was not authorized to look at, namely uh, data associated with U.S. citizens. Now, um, what was your second question again? Well, I, I actually I asked if other people feel free and safe to come out and criticize or blow the whistle. Yes. My second question was about uh, the FISA court. No, no, people do not feel safe. Uh, you, I have to believe there are others that would love the chance to come forward, but because they have jobs and depend on the government for their incomes and their welfare, they uh, are afraid to do so. Uh, so it's, it's a terrible kind of suppression um, of uh, free information. Uh, but I'm certain there are others that would like to come out. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for joining us. Those were our questions. My um, all the best. Then uh, we'll continue. Then, then we'll we're we're a, lit, a little bit behind schedule now. Um, our last speaker in this session is Mrs. Machon, I hope I got it right now, <laughs> from a uh, former um, uh, MI5 okay. official. Thank you very much for inviting me to um, make a statement to this committee. I'm going to be talking a bit about the UK setup, the intelligence world, and the legal regulations and restrictions, and also around the, what happens to whistleblowers coming out of UK intelligence. I then have a few recommendations which I would respectfully like to put in front of the committee, which I would hope would generate a little more discussion later on this afternoon. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the UK intelligence setup, our agencies have been around much longer than the U US. Uh, they're just over 100 years old now, and for the first 80 years of their existence, they didn't officially exist. Our members of parliament were not allowed to ask questions to find out what they were doing. And a law was put in place soon after their inception in 1911, the very first official secrets act, which was there to try and prevent the leaking and betrayal of national security secrets to our enemy powers. If you were found guilty under this law, you were a traitor and you received 14 years in prison. And this law is still in place. However, after their 80 years of as the 80s spycatcher novelist uh, writer Peter Wright once said, bugging and burgling their way around London with impunity. In the 1980s, there were a series of whistleblowing scandals. And as a result of this, some more laws were put in place, which were key to the later development of what I want to talk about today. First of all, the, the Official Secrets Act was updated. Because of the whistleblowing scandals in the 1980s, they stripped out what had existed before, which was if someone blew the whistle, they could exercise a public interest defense. This was removed from the 89 Act, and what was put in place is what the lawyers call a clear bright line against disclosure, which means that if you are a former or serving intelligence officer, you automatically break the law if you talk about your work to anyone outside the agency for which you work. However, at the same time, in 1989, they set up the Security Service Act to regulate the work of MI5 to a more democratic degree. And then in 1994, MI6, the Intelligen uh, International Intelligence Gathering Agency, and our listening post, GCHQ, were also put on a legal footing with the 1994 Intelligence Services Act. And this act was key as well, because for the very first time, it set in place a, parliament, uh, a committee in Parliament which was supposedly to have some sort of notional oversight of the work of the intelligence agencies. However, until this year, that committee, the Intelligence and Security Committee, has been toothless because it was only able to investigate policy, finance, and administration. And as other scandals have unfolded in the last 20 years, they were unable to call for witnesses from the intelligence agencies, subpoena them, demand access to documents, or to investigate allegations of crime. So that's the, the current framework in the UK. And it's ironic, I find it somewhat ironic to be discussing the UK now, as of course they are very much the partners in crime, apparently, um, looking at the current NSA revelations from Edward Snowden. So I worked for MI5 in the 1990s. And this is why it was crucial to have all these new laws put in place when I joined, because it was probably the most ethical era of 
MI5's 100-year existence. Suddenly they're on a legal footing for the first time, and this is before the tragic events of 9-11 when the intelligence gloves came off. And yet despite that, I and my former partner, a man called David Shaler, saw so many things going wrong in the six years we worked for MI5 that we felt compelled to resign and compelled to blow the whistle. We had raised our concerns on the inside, as had many of our peer group who were all resigning in record numbers around the same time. And yet we were told to shut up, not rock the boat, and just follow orders. There was no effective avenue for ventilation outside the intelligence agencies. So David Shaler <coughs> and I, I helped him, decided to blow the whistle on a whole series of crimes that we saw being committed. And these sort of escalated over our years in MI5, starting with files on our government ministers, the very people who are supposed to hold the spies to account, had secret information held on them by the spies. There were illegal phone taps of left-wing journalists, innocent people put in prison when MI5 had information that indicated they could be innocent, but they withheld it from the trial. IRA bombs that could and should have been prevented going off on UK streets, and then MI5 lying to government to cover up its mistakes. And most crucially for us, this was the case that made us quit, was MI6's involvement in funding a terrorist operation in Libya to try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi in 1996. This went wrong. It was illegal under UK law, and innocent people were killed. We could not think of a more heinous act to have witnessed, and this is why we decided to resign and blow the whistle. And we knew we faced prosecution under the 1989 Official Secrets Act by going public. So we went literally on the run, a bit like Edward Snowden. And we had to live in hiding in France for a year, and then live in exile in France for another two years, because MI5 was trying to prosecute us. David, in fact, was prosecuted. He went to prison not once but twice. First of all, when the UK failed to extradite him from France to stand trial under the Official Secrets Act in 1988. And then, secondly, after he had returned to the UK voluntarily to stand trial for a breach of the Official Secrets Act, and he was found guilty in 2002. So it was a, a very frightening experience to go through. And, of course, we had to give up our, our jobs, our career prospects, our very way of life and, of course, risk prison. And it wasn't just us who did that. David, as I said, went to prison. I was arrested, but his brother was arrested. His two best friends were arrested. Journalists were arrested and threatened with prosecution around this case for daring to expose the crimes of the spies. It was also a salutary lesson to us as well for what it's like to live under a state of constant possible surveillance where you can't feel that you can have a private telephone conversation or send private emails where you can't feel that you can have a private conversation in the privacy of your own home, even your bedroom, and also potentially where your friends may be pressured to report on you. And that's what it would be like to live under a Stasi-type state, and that's how we felt we had to live for a number of years. What was also interesting around the case was looking at how the media, who notionally should be able to hold the spies to account, could also be legally controlled. There is a raft of legislation in the UK that can be used to threaten the media and is indeed being used at the moment to stifle media debate about the Edward Snowden case. These include injunctions, super injunctions where you can't even discuss there is an injunction. There are um, public interest immunity certificates that the government can use which are like injunctions. They use the Terrorism Act to threaten journalists. They also have a voluntary system called the D-Notice Committee, and a D-Notice has been issued to stifle legitimate debate within our mainstream media about Edward Snowden. Finally, of course, it's not just the whistleblower in UK law who faces prosecution. Also, our journalists can be prosecuted under Section 5 of the 1989 Whistleblowers Act if they cause damage to national security by reporting the stories given to them by the whistleblowers. This is more draconian even than in Russia today. So it's a bit of a mess in the UK. Um, there is notional oversight provision. For example, we do have the ISC, Intelligence and Security Committee, which I mentioned, but they have been largely toothless. And also many stories have emerged over the last decade to show that senior spies have admitted to getting away with lying to that committee. Because they can, because the committee has no way of forcing the issue. 
The idea there is no, some notional democratic oversight. For example, if MI5 wants to bug our communications, then theoretically they have to get a home office warrant signed off by the minister who's their boss. Unfortunately, the, the politician only <coughs> gets to see a summary of a summary of a summary of a summary of the intelligence case, and it's very easy for the spies to big up that intelligence case and ensure that they get the permission required. They can also go for what are called omnibus warrants, and that is what I think we are seeing, for example, with the GCHQ use of the tempera um, surveillance technique, which William Haig, our current Foreign Secretary, said of course was legal, of course there was oversight under the ISA, but in fact this seems to be in nebulous legal ground because if this is an omnibus warrant covering millions or billions of communications, then one warrant being signed off every six months automatically is not efficient oversight. So why is whistleblowing important in the UK? We don't have a written constitution. This is one of the, the issues that came up before. We don't have a written constitution, and we have effectively the least accountable and most legally protected of all intelligence communities in the Western world. And because of this incredibly closed mindset, we get a sort of groupthink building up on the inside. If you're told not to rock the boat, told not to question ethical decisions, then those who do have ethical qualms often resign, and those who don't stay and get promoted. And I think this is what we've seen, for example, with the allegations of MI5 and MI6 being involved in torture cases over the last decade since 9-11. In the 1990s, the spies did not use torture. It was unethical and it was ineffectual and it created blowback. And they'd learned this lesson the hard way in Northern Ireland in the 1970s. However, suddenly after 9-11, they seem to have forgotten those lessons. And perhaps this sort of closed mindset, this groupthink, self-perpetuating oligarchy and lack of ventilation allow them to take that moral slide down towards involvement in torture again. So whistleblowers can add, or ventilation can add, a very powerful check to that sort of dangerous moral slide, in my opinion. There's also, of course, a war on whistleblowers going on, particularly in the US, where I think Obama has used the Espionage Act more times to try and persecute whistleblowers in his brief presidency than all other presidents since 1917 combined. This is nothing if not a war on whistleblowers. And yet it contrasts, in my mind, very starkly with the treatment meted out to real spies. You'll probably remember the Russian spy ring, the illegals who were caught in America in 2010. And yet a deal was done and they were handed over to Russia with no prosecution under this Espionage Act, which is wheeled out time and again to persecute whistleblowers, legitimate whistleblowers in the US. And I think this hypocrisy is breathtaking. And I think we need whistleblowers now. With this encroaching surveillance state, with this global surveillance um, dystopia that is gradually emerging from the Snowden revelations, and also, of course, with the spread of other questionable activities around the world, things like CIA kill lists, the assassination of terrorist suspects without due process by the use of drones, um, the invasion of sovereign countries on dubious intelligence, which in, in the past, for example, with the invasion of Iraq, has been proven to have been based on lies. All these things cry out for the need for greater accountability and greater transparency. And it's only by having those two key aspects can we hope for greater justice. So what would be some recommendations I would like to throw into the process, to throw into the debate, because we're looking at the legal protection of whistleblowers. And one thing, particularly in the UK, I would suggest, is that we need meaningful, power, um, meaningful parliamentary oversight, real parliamentary oversight. We need a parliamentary, a parliamentary committee which is elected by Parliament, not appointed by the Prime Minister, which has full, wide-ranging legal powers to take the evidence of whistleblowers, to allow them a legal channel to go to, so they don't have to turn their lives inside out by exposing the crimes of the spies. We also need, we need the fact that this committee in Parliament would be trusted by the whistleblowers to carry out a real and effective um, investigation into any allegations of malfeasance by the spies. And this would include a full inquiry conducted, evidence gathered and taken from all sides, reforms applied, and indeed crimes, if they are found to have been committed, to be punished. 
At this stage, it's very easy for the spies and the spy masters to cover up and lie when they're caught out doing something wrong. <clears throat> I would also suggest that certainly in the UK, we need a legal definition of what constitutes national security because we don't currently have that under the law. And much, much is made of we need to protect national security. And often the spies will conflate that with the national interest, which is not a reason to shut up whistleblowers and impede their freedom of expression under, under Article 10.2 of the European Convention of Human Rights. So we need a proper legal definition and a, an understanding as well that to protect national security means that you have to protect the integrity and the future existence of your nation state. So the odd bomb going off on the streets is traumatizing and terrible, but it does not threaten the national integrity of the state. Some other quick suggestions. One would be, of course, there was some very good evidence put in by um, Duncan Campbell about the Echelon report from 10 years ago. That needs, in my view, to be revisited. It was a perfect opportunity for Europe to build its own key um, communications infrastructure to break away from the American hegemony and also to provide protection for its citizens and also to try and ensure that the US complies with the European Convention on Human Rights and our standards within our communities and countries. Finally and just quickly to conclude, we need technology policies that allow us to protect ourselves if our states won't do that for us. So for example, if we are unable to protect ourselves on the communications network, what we can do is take steps as individual citizens to protect ourselves. Take our own steps. Move away from the US proprietary closed corporate software systems and develop our own because it would be good for our EU economy too. And finally, why do we all do this as whistleblowers? Just to finish, we need free media. We need a free internet. Because if we don't have that, if we can't read and write and listen and discuss ideas freely and in privacy, we are indeed living in an Orwellian dystopia and we're all potentially at risk. The central societal function of privacy in our communications is not just so that we can chat away to each other with nobody eavesdropping, although it's very corrosive to feel that you are being surveyed and listened to all the time, as I've experienced personally myself. But privacy, private communications, is the bedrock and defense against encroaching surveillance states and potentially encroaching extremist states. And as we've seen, for example, the rise of Golden Dawn in Greece, who can say where our polit political systems will take us in future? And this is why we need to protect and ensure our privacy now. So just as a final comment, I would suggest that there is no balance between privacy and security is the um, argument that the spies and the intelligence agencies always bring out, they trot it out, that we have to get this balance between privacy and security. I would suggest this is a false dichotomy. We need that privacy in order to have that security that we will not be predated on by potentially hostile powers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to open the uh, question and answer session to Mr. Drake and Ms. Marchon. Uh, we, we do the usual routine. So um, just to be practical, we are seriously behind schedule now. So I'm already going to, first of all, going to uh, inform the rapporteur here that we will probably reduce your 10 minutes of drawing conclusions to one. I don't want, I want you know, to. Okay, you. we've just gained 10 minutes. Right, yeah. um, and I'm, I'm also already going to mentally prepare the, the speakers at the next session uh, that I, you know, I'm going to ask them to be even more brief than you were already prepared to do because we, we, um, uh, we're really behind time and we, are, we're, we have to finish at 6.30 because of the interpretation. Um, Mr. Moraes, the rapporteur. Yeah, I'll spare you from my conclusions. You're all here. But anyway, um, my question may seem mundane given the um, intensity of all of these um, contributions, but one of the big things we have to do in our report finally is to understand what the space is um, philosophically and practically for whistleblowers, uh, where you sit um, and where you um, actually say what you have to say. 
Now, um, in the US experience, you have this presidential policy, Directive 19, which President Obama talked about. Now, I know what, what you're going to say about this, um, that it doesn't really provide whistleblowers with anything to say. I know you're going to say that. But you need to explain to us um, on the record what it means. That gives um, whistleblowers the internal possibility um, of saying something according to the US authorities. But if it doesn't, then tell us where a whistleblower in the United States from the NSA who genuinely sees something happening can say it in any sort of safety. If they can't, then what does that say for any whistleblower? Um, does it mean there is, there is no scope? Um, is there any legislative scope at, at all? And then what, in your opinion, does it say for us here in the European Union or in any of the member states? And for the United Kingdom example, I mean, I'm very familiar with the UK, and I would just say that it isn't really much to do with the unwritten constitution because we have many examples in other member states with uh, written constitutions where we have the same problems of, of lack of national intelligence scrutiny. Um, but again, for whistleblowers in, this, in individual member states, we don't have parliamentary scrutiny in most member states. We've, we've already learned that. So again, for individual EU member states, um, there is insufficient protection. So in some more detail, what would you see it, are, are the protections we should recommend here in the European Parliament, finally in the report? Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask uh, all the, the, the speakers to really stick to two minutes max. You can even be shorter if you want. Mr. Vos for the EPP. Um, I'd like to speak German again. Of course, we're all trying to strike the necessary balance between the security we need and the necessary privacy. As far as I understand it, we're also trying to establish to what extent at all, with all this data surveillance, we can still maintain the rule of law. And so I'd like to ask you both whether the data which are collected predominantly or at all are used without the necessary entitlements. Are they used and evaluated without those powers? And are the data being used for industrial espionage or for political espionage? Or are they actually being used uh, to fend off potential dangers? So I'd like to hear what you know about that. Mr. Albrecht. Thank you, first of all, for being here, for bringing us uh, your views. It's very important for us. And I think one thing is very important, uh, and that's the first part of my question. Um, which is the actual scale which you has, have seen uh, of blanket retention by these intelligence services? I mean, uh, you have been, uh, Mr. Drake, with the NSA until 2006. You know what happened until them, then, and it would be very important for us to know which ex to which extent that happened at that time, and also in the MI5 uh, uh, I think that would be helpful to get an insight of what is actually happening and possible. And the second part of my question would be, you talked about oversight, by, uh, so parliamentary oversight. Uh, how do you see that this could be done effectively? That is the big question. We need to answer it, and that's what we want to do here in the European Parliament. So if you have recommendations to that, I would be very happy. And, of course, on whistleblower protection, but you already said uh, quite a lot. But if you could concretely say something on data protection rules, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody on behalf of the ECR. So then we go to Gue, Mrs. Ernst. Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Well, firstly, uh, I'm very pleased. I'd like to express my respect for the fact that you're here. It's really a very good day for us, I think. And uh, so two questions to you, please. Firstly, parliamentary scrutiny. How is it possible? You said, Mrs. Mahon, that uh, 
we ought to have an independent parliamentary scrutiny committee uh, and how could that actually be done at European and national level in tangible terms and my second point which is very dear to my heart what kind of legislation do we could we have in place to uh, protect whistleblowers something needs to be done on what level should it be what what should we be doing I've read something from you in the form of some regulations and I thought that was very good but when it comes to protecting whistleblowers that's really a red line as far as we're concerned uh, in our discussions on data protection I really think that something needs to be done in the strongest possible terms and I would just like you to give us some pointers on that. Thank you Mrs Ernst uh, then um, I will ask the last question in this round on behalf of uh, Alde, a shadow of Alde. Um, I was rather struck by the, uh, the expression you used, the war on whistleblowers, which is really, if you listen carefully, the war on democracy. Because if all the oversight mechanisms don't work, if the transparency mechanisms don't work, then you know, basically whistleblowers uh, are the only instrument we have left, if you'll uh, uh, excuse me for using the word instrument to indicate you, um, to know what's going on, because, uh, I mean, as unbelievable as it may sound, this all gives the impression of completely runaway secret services, you know, behaving like Dirty Harry and cowboys. Um, the word ethos somehow, you know, sits. And I, I, have two, I have two questions. You know, there's still people who, there are actually people, members of this house, who have called whistleblowers criminals who should be convicted. Unfortunately, the people who said that aren't present here today. They didn't feel the need to come. Um, but what would you say to those people who say whistleblowers are criminals and these programs are necessary to keep us safe? Um, are we naive or are they just seriously misguided? My second question is, why do um, bodies like Congress or indeed um, uh, the, the British Parliament or any na other national parliament, why do they accept to be led by the nose? Why do they accept that? Why do they accept, I mean, you know, there seems to be a state in the state, but if we pretend that we are a democracy, if we believe that we have the moral authority to lecture the rest of the world, then why is it that parliaments don't function? Why don't they exercise their, um, their, 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 their rights of scrutiny? Why don't they do their duties? That is what, what I cannot understand. I hope you can answer. Um, shall I start with Mr. Drake for answering the questions? In terms of whistleblower protection, I'll defer to the statement and testimony of Jocelyn Raddick that's coming up. I believe she can provide you insight in that regard. The fact remains in my case, I was completely exposed. Any existing law that existed was a paper tiger. And uh, I had no cause of action or recourse in the court system. Um, and there's a lot more to say on that, but I'll, I'll defer to uh, Ms. Raddick. Um, the data retention question, uh, rule of law, the, the issue is actually under, under US law, going back to the normative understandings foundation of the Fourth Amendment. You, mu you, must, you must have a probable cause uh, supported by an affidavit. And it doesn't matter. What, what's happened here is that in the greatest of secrecy, and now we're starting to see even more of the, of the disclosures of how far that actually went, um, you can't, basically the government has decided to simply seize and then search later. The threshold is actually at the search point, the particularized search, the particularized place, location. And what are those items you wish, wish to seize? Um, the question about industrial, uh, financial, or other forms of espionage, I believe the disclosures that you are um, seeing in the press uh, are significant evidence uh, pointing to the use of intelligence or repurposing uh, intelligence based on secret accesses for other reasons. Um, this has been one of the, the great elephants in the room is beyond just the claim of, of having intelligence to quote unquote defeat or protect or to blunt terrorism and other related activities. When you have that kind of information, what else could it be used for? It could also be used, I would add, for political purposes. Um, in terms of the scale, um, 
in terms of the scale, I actually was at NSA until 2008. I was aware of the beginning foundations of the PRISM program. This, that was basically the attempt by the U.S. government to put what had been disclosed uh, in the previous two years back into a much larger Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act box and then secretly interpret it to continue to have access, unfettered access to what they had been uh, doing for the previous four or five years. Um, NSA, frankly, had unfettered access without any of the intervening Enabling Act legislation and then secretly reinterpreted um, Section 215 of the Patriot Act in 2006 under a relevancy clause to gain access to a staggering amounts of data, including all phone records from the major telcos. So for me, it's sort of an echo chamber effect. The Snowden disclosures, in fact, are simply evidence of the industrial scale and nature that's become of very much normalized, institutionalized. Um, in terms of oversight, I, I say this somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but quite serious. What we have are undersight committees in the U.S. Legisla legislature. Um, they're, high, they're completely compromised. There's only a few senators and representatives who are willing to stand up. Um, part of it is another elephant in a room is there's tremendous amounts of money part of what I blew the whistle on, staggering amounts of money uh, being made by private corporations in league with the government uh, for surveillance. Surveillance, frankly, is a huge growth industry. And you have not just corporations selling data, monetizing data for a profit, they get to do the same thing by selling the subscriber information to the government, and they're not doing so gratis, believe me. Uh, war on democracy is ex extraordinarily uh, critical and insightful um, way of saying it, that's ultimately what's at stake here, uh, is are the very foundations of democracy. Um, you, well, something has to give. And when you have secret laws and secret evidence and secret courts and secret opinions, uh, then democracy itself is imperiled. And it does, history is not kind. The problem is we have extraordinary technology, and I would certainly urge in the strongest possible language, that this body seriously consider what is absolutely necessary to protect the sovereignty and integrity of your member nations, but most importantly, the sovereignty of your individual citizens. What you're seeing is the replacement uh, of the rule of law. Uh, that is the great equalizer by a pernicious form of, of authoritarianism. And there is history in this continent alone, having lived here myself for over six years, there is history that I think should speak extraordinarily powerfully in terms of what happens when you live inside authoritarian and even fascist states. Thank you. Ms. Michon. I shall try and keep these as brief as possible. Um, and perhaps there seem to be a number of similar themes coming out from the questions, so if I can conflate them. Um, first of all, how can we protect whistleblowers or beef up the oversight or draw up laws, what's necessary to protect future whistleblowers, if possible, within the EU? Um, I think certainly the setting up of parliamentary committees, meaningful parliamentary committees with proper legal powers to investigate allegations of crime coming from within the intelligence agencies in all our countries would be a good first step and they would have to prove themselves and be seen to properly investigate these um, these operations. Um, that would be a good first step. Then we could also try and institute some greater protections for the individual whistleblowers. So for example, in the UK, there is a law in place called the Public Interest Disclosure Act 1998, which is there to protect whistleblowers. So they can't be victimized, they cannot be sacked, etc. Of course, the intelligence agencies are specifically excluded from that, as they are specifically excluded from the Freedom of Information Act we have. Perhaps we should think about including them under some of these sort of legislations. The other thing to bear in mind is um, that we, even within the spy agencies themselves, they only reckon that there are three types of secrets that really need to be kept secret, and they're logical. Ongoing operations, which if they're exposed would blow the operation. Sensitive operational techniques, well, I mean, that's blown wide open now with the NSA scandal. But in the UK, for example, we still can't use telephone intercept in legal cases because it's supposed to be secret. So that's how ridiculous the law can be. Um, and the, the third point which needs to be kept secret is agent names. Those who are infiltrating groups on our behalf and risking their lives, of course. 
But even within the spy agencies, that is what they acknowledge needs to be kept secret. The yeah, EFS was an operation five years ago, and that comes out, so what? But we still, as citizens, need to know fairly relative intelligence operations in order to have an informed perspective when we get, then go to vote for what sort of parliamentary people we want in there who will control the intelligence agencies. So in terms of real secrets, perhaps a reform of, in the UK, the Official Secrets Act 1989. Let's put back the public interest defense that was taken out specifically to get whistleblowers. And in fact, most of the people who then went on to become the Labour government voted against the removal of this public interest defence. So I think that also needs to go back in. So that's all at a national level. Just one point on the, parliament, uh, the European parliamentary level. Perhaps if those national oversight bodies fail, there could be a sort of um, an appeal route or something you know, that European citizens from any country, intelligence whistleblowers from any country, could then appeal to this body for help in not having to go to prison, in getting investigations into spy crimes investigated. Um, picking up on the war on democracy as well, I think you are absolutely right. And I think the tensions have been, the intelligence agencies have been well aware of the tensions building between um, the, the digital natives, the spread of the internet, and the spread of free speech and ideas and knowledge, um, and their power to control us. So I would call it almost like an arms race, what has been going on with the NSA, certainly, and GCHQ, certainly, over the last 10, 15 years, where they are trying to get um, more and vaster ways of taking away our privacy, working out what we're thinking and reading and who we're meeting and what our strategies are. So it's an arms race between us, and I think this is a last chance for the European community to make a stand and say, let's not go down this path, let's not be taken over by these sort of technologies, and we can do that. I know you've heard evidence from other more technologically expert people than I, but we can do this by getting, weaning ourselves off our US internet dependencies, creating the jobs, creating our own infrastructure, creating the educational values that will protect us as citizens within the EU, because as the European Parliament, your first duty is to protect the EU citizens. Um, just one final thing, picking up on the point about are we traitors? Well, of course, some people say that. I wish those people had been here today because I would love them to hear this answer. And it's something that's been thrown at me and many other whistleblowers time and again. I signed up and I signed the Official Secrets Act. I signed up to make a difference. I was motivated to have a job that could potentially save lives. And that motivation is what carried me through into blowing the whistle to potentially save future lives from spy crimes. And I signed the Official Secrets Act to protect official secrets, which is what I have done and what I will continue to do for all the successful operations that I saw or was involved in. However, I did not sign up to protect unofficial secrets and spy crimes. And that's all I and David ever exposed in the public interest. And if we'd been prosecuted under the 1911 Official Secrets Act, we would have had that defense. He wouldn't have had to go to prison. So, why on earth are the criminals within the intelligence agencies not the ones on trial? The people who were involved in MI6 funding Al-Qaeda associates in Libya in 1996 were never even questioned by the police. They were certainly not charged with conspiracy to murder. They were certainly not convicted or imprisoned. But the whistleblower was for exposing that crime. And we see something similar, we have seen recently something similar with the Chelsea Manning case, where he exposed primarily the collateral murder video you remember that, the helicopter gunship? It's like a snuff video game where the soldiers were shooting up children and journalists and innocent people. And he exposed that war crime. And he's the one in prison, not the pilots who gloated with enjoyment as they murdered those children and those journalists and their family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming and um, giving evidence. And, um... I think that's an endorsement of the work you've done and the courage that you have shown. It's not very, very common that we have applause in this committee, so you can take that as a big, big compliment. Okay, then we're going to move on very quickly um, to our last session. Sorry, you're absolutely right. We have a question left. Um, I apologize to Mr. Bronze. Mrs. Morvai, but Mrs. Morvai is going to be very, very brief because you've had the floor. Mr. Bronze first. 
I, sorry, I, I got oh, mixed sure. up. We are, we're not at I the end of the I wasn't accusing you of... Yet. Right. Uh, Mr. Drake's testimony that 9-11 was the watershed shows that whatever the articulated purpose of the perpetrators of that outrage, the function it's fulfilled is to provide the pretext for surveillance. To what extent did NSA operatives and other agencies have the desire for surveillance before it found the pretext that it wanted? You revealed that action taken against you for revealing... Uh, uh, NSA uh, activities, um, have you witnessed it being used for wider political purposes against enemies of the political class that have causes unconnected with surveillance? Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Macken, uh, <coughs> I, I'd like to ask you how data is used. You mentioned about ministers and I think journalists uh, being under surveillance. Are they threatened with exposure if they act in a way that's disapproved of? Uh, Mr. Haig uh, has shown a willingness to cooperate with the security services. Could I ask very cautiously, uh, has he done this willingly? Because some of his activities could be said to make him vulnerable. I'll say no more than that. Um, do the security services in the UK use information in wider political causes, unconnected with revelations about security? Is there simply a bureaucratic desire to defend the institutional interests of the security services, or does it have a wider political agenda? If so, whose agenda is it? Uh, it's all very well to ask what would happen if some bogeymen came to power. I suspect that governments of many, possibly all political persuasions, if they had the temptation, they would take it. Thank you. That's probably true. Mr. Mrs. Morf, I'd be, be as brief as you can, please. Uh, I don't know why exactly do I need to be briefer than anybody else. I mean, there, there are hardly well, any members be, of the committee you, you the here. So the third time, and I'm just looking at everybody the clock, else had two all. minutes, so let me have two minutes too, Ms. Uh, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, the, the most ob obvious question is uh, how can the, the, the sun rise every day after, the, after your revelations and the revelations of, uh, of Mr. Snowden? Uh, but on a more concrete uh, note, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Drake, the, the, the Stasi uh, agents and the, the, the work of Stasi collecting uh, data. At this point in time, uh, basically everybody agrees that state socialism or communism was a dictatorship and that was one of the means of the dictatorship to achieve whatever aim that they had. This is a kind of a politically correct, accepted uh, statement. But uh, is there a dictatorship today? This is a much less politically correct statement or even question that uh, are we talking about a dictatorship uh, today and who are the dictators? Uh, is it the United States or is it, uh, I don't know, corporations, multinational companies, bankers, hand in hand and hand in hand with the political power and the one percent having a dictatorship over the 99%, what, what's going on here? Uh, you said that uh, it all uh, started with 9-11, but that was the Echelon uh, affair beforehand, so did it really start with 9-11? And the last question, what uh, gave you, the, the, the two of you, the, the power to, to go through all this uh, suffering and difficulties in order to save... Uh, freedom for all of us. Thank you so much, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I invite Mr. Drake first to answer? I'll start with the last first. Um, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution. It was a grand experiment launched over two and 20 years ago, and it was an idea in how to best govern ourselves back across the Atlantic Ocean an idea. And similar to Annie Michon, I didn't take an oath to secrecy. I didn't take an oath to um, illegalities. I didn't take an oath to violating the sovereignty of, of people. And so it's fundamental to why I stood up. I recognize, and is my, if I've met other colleagues who've done a similar, um, a similar crisis of conscience, uh, that was what I chose to do uh, for the future. It wasn't me, it was about others. 
Um, I could not stand by and see this aversion of the very um, way of life that I had taken out of Spartan Fen four times in my government career. Uh, and I did so knowing that it was at great risk, particularly in the post-9-11 world. Uh, and I stayed as long as I could within the system until I could no longer remain. In terms of the Stasi, I'm really reflecting, you know, you say dictatorship. Yeah, there's powerful interests, both political and, and corporate. Um, I have referred to it as soft tyranny. Um, the problem is with the kind of technology we have, it doesn't take much for the surveillance state, particularly if you've seen the recent revelations, to find out just about anything there is on just about anybody at any time. Um, in, uh, I'm going to the other question about NSA. NSA actually came to Internet late, and the reason is they didn't think there was anything worth knowing uh, on Internet because it was open. The only things worth knowing were those things that were secret, ironically enough. Uh, that dramatically changed in the years preceding 9-11, um, and I will, I'll just briefly say that during the presidential um, transition team under George Bush in the year 2000, the fall of 2000, NSA actually, and it's out there on the Internet, uh, put together a paper that would significantly erode the probable cause standard of the Fourth Amendment. They were already looking for ways, and when 9-11 occurred, it simply became the, the, just, the pretextual justification to expand the surveillance state in a quite significant manner. Um, I think that answers most of the questions that I recall. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Marshall. Well, those are very interesting questions, thank you. And I could actually do a whole new talk on them, but I shall skip quickly through the key points. Uh, first of all, are politicians in the UK or media types compelled by the spies to do their bidding because of secret information held on them. They are never allowed to see what's held on them, um, even if they are the Home Secretary in charge of MI5 or the Foreign Secretary in charge of MI6 and GCHQ. They are not, even at that time, allowed to see the files held on them. So, for example, Jack Straw, when he was Foreign Secretary or Home Secretary, was not allowed to. So they don't know what the spies know about them. But you can imagine with politicians, all the, you know, some of the little guilty secrets or that affair might come back or something like that. And with journalists, exactly the same thing. Because they don't know, that causes greater fear, potentially, in their minds. And uh, that, I think, particularly is why the former Labour government was so keen to kowtow to the intelligence community and to shred uh, and give them lots of more resources and powers in the, 19, in the, two, in the noughties. Um, do they look at wider political courses? Yes, and they have done, and so do the un undercover police officers, which um, sort of inherited this work, political work, from the spies in the 1990s. But I think what is more concerning is how the goalposts are moving within UK law, so that the undercover cops, the police officers, were investigating domestic extremists, even though that is not a category recognized under UK law. And groups which are pure activist groups, such as Occupy in the City of London, were deemed by the City of London police to be domestic extremist slash terrorist group. And we all know how terrorists can be treated under the law these days. So the goalposts themselves can move. And if they change the definition of what your activist group is, you become a legitimate target. And that's a real danger in a democracy. Um, why do they keep holding on to power? It's jobs for the boys, essentially. So when the Cold War ended, what were you going to do? We had MI5 with all this free time on their hands. Let's give them IRA terrorism to work on. Oh, we have the peace process in Northern Ireland. Let's give them Al-Qaeda to work on. Rather than set, taking a step back and saying, what are the threats to our real national security, our national existential integrity, and how do we best protect ourselves from those threats? And that if MI5 is not up to the job, then get rid of it. Set up a counterterrorism agency made of the best and the bright from the police and the spooks or whatever, and make sure they work under the conditions that the police have to work under, evidentially and with accountability and oversight. We have MI5 policing terrorist groups in secret with no accountability when they're supposed to be doing a police-type job. Finally, um, are we living under a dictatorship? I would go back to Mussolini's famous quote about what is fascism, what is the pure definition of fascism, and his view was the merger of the corporate and the state. Now, looking at these mega global corporations, looking at the lobby groups that can and have influenced certain key legislation, even in this august institution, like the ACTA, the anti-copyright trade agreement last year, which activists heard, most MEPs were not even allowed to read, they were just expected to sign, 
That is corporations taking over the function of the state. And I think this is just one final comment. This takes us back as well to the uh, valedictory warnings from history of the outgoing President Eisenhower in 1961 in the US, where he warned of the military industrial complex. I think this has morphed hideously, hydra-like, into the military security intelligence complex. And security particularly, and war and terror particularly, and intelligence and surveillance particularly, are very good for big business and mega corporations, as Tom Strake mentioned earlier. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, and I apologize again for the confusion earlier on. That concludes this session. Then we are going to the last session. I'm going to invite the next speakers to join us on the podium. Uh, I apologize to you, um, you know, because your, your speeches will be cut short a little bit. I'm going to ask you to each speak for a maximum of 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll have 10 minutes left for a question and answer, so we'll have to be really quick. And, um, if we need a few more minutes, I'm going to look very kindly at the interpreters and ask them if they could spare us a few more minutes um, and, and extend the meeting a little bit. Um, as you are taking your seats, very welcome here. Um, we have two speakers from NGOs active in the legal protection of whistleblowers. The first speaker to my right is Mrs. Jess Jesselyn Radak. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, National Security and Human Rights Director at the Government Accountability Project, representing six whistleblowers, including Mr. Drake and Mr. Riebe. Uh, and after that, we'll hear Mr. John David. Is that correct? David. David. David yeah. Sorry, Chief Executive of Transparency International in Ireland. I'm first going to invite Mrs. Radak to take the floor for about 10 minutes. Thank you to the European Parliament for inviting me to contribute to this significant and historic series of hearings. I commend the Lieb Committee for their attention to the secret and illegal surveillance operations that National Security Agency whistleblower Edward Snowden brought to light. It is my hope that similar political bodies around the world will follow your example. Without courageous whistleblowers like Mr. Snowden, the world would not know the enormity of the NSA surveillance activities in my country or in member states. Instead, the public would rely on half-truths and outright lies from U.S. government officials. Mr. Snowden's disclosures have brought to the forefront a much-needed public debate about the U.S. government's exorbitant, expansive, and often ineffective surveillance apparatus. I head the National Security and Human Rights Program at the Government Accountability Project, the leading whistleblower protection organization in the United States. As a whistleblower attorney, I've seen the workplace retaliation that usually happens to whistleblowers time and again, the scathing performance reviews, demotions, and often termination when employees reveal gross fraud, waste, abuse, and illegality. It was in 2010, however, when I first introduced, I was first introduced to the dr draconian and clandestine world of the National Security Agency. That was a year I began representing Thomas Drake, from whom you just heard. I myself am a whistleblower. I blew the whistle on government misconduct in the United States' first high-profile terrorism prosecution after 9-11. I learned firsthand that the Bush administration was willing to escalate retaliation against whistleblowers, destroying not only their jobs, but their careers by going after their security clearances and their professional licenses and putting them on terrorist watch lists. But when President Obama's administration indicted Thomas Drake and did so under the Espionage Act, the most serious charge that can be leveled against an American, I knew the U.S crossed the Rubicon by criminalizing the truth. Although the prosecution of Mr. Drake collapsed, 
the United States government continue to indict national security and intelligence community whistleblowers for espionage. Employees in these communities have no whistleblower protection and have been specifically excluded. The fact remains that in less than a year, President Obama indicted more people under the Espionage Act, most of whom are whistleblowers, than all previous presidents combined. The witch hunt intensified with the historic, earth-shattering revelations of WikiLeaks, a publishing organization committed to transparency, which published the largest trove of secret documents in the history of the world, those disclosed by private Chelsea Manning. Under the extraordinary leadership of Julian Assange, himself under a sealed U.S. indictment and in his own virtual imprisonment in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, WikiLeaks has literally changed the face of journalism been an unfailing supporter of all whistleblowers and redefined transparency in the digital age. The U.S., however, has tried in myriad ways to criminalize whistleblowing and reporters associated with it in order to send a chilling message to anyone even thinking of speaking truth to power. What the U.S. government calls espionage I call having moral courage to express and expose some of the most egregious, tightly held illegalities of the past decade, including torture, war crimes, and mass surveillance on an unprecedented scale. The brave souls who exposed these things are individuals earnestly committed not to a president or to an agency, or to a boss, but to the interest of their country and humanity at large. Historically, such people were forced to choose between their conscience and their career. But now the stakes are much higher. They risk their freedom and their lives. We are in the throes of an asymmetrical war on whistleblowers in the United States. And yet the war on whistleblowers has metastasized into a war on journalists. The reporters who work to publicize whistleblower disclosures are not only the subject of surveillance themselves, but are also now the subject of criminal subpoenas, search warrants, and threats of prosecution for simply doing their jobs. What is emerging from the war on whistleblowers journalists, hacktivists, and dissidents is a larger, more insidious war on information. Why? Because we live in an information age, and information is the currency of power. What we are witnessing is a global power grab on a scale the world has never seen. You heard earlier today facts we now know to be true because of Mr. Snowden's revelations, including NSA increasingly engaging in massive cyber operations to hack into foreign computer networks of both friend and foe to steal information, sabotage infrastructure, and spy on citizens. And two, the U.S. has spent more than $500 billion on intelligence since 9-11, and has now exceeded the equivalent Cold War spending levels. In a breathtaking act of civic courage, one man pried open the most powerful secret intelligence agency in the world to benefit the global populace. In a cascade of revelations started by Glenn Greenwald and Laura Portress, each revelation more disturbing than the one before. Journalists around the world have been publicizing the information Mr. Snowden risked his life to release. This honorable body recognizes the significance of these revelations and how important they are to an informed public. I respectfully request that the committee strengthen laws to protect whistleblowers, 
laws to protect privacy, and laws to protect the rights of publishers in the European Union to disseminate such revelations without fear of criminal penalty. I hope this investigation can be expanded even further as more revelations emerge. As U.S. President Lincoln said 150 years ago, quote, worse than traitors in arms are men who pretend loyalty to the flag, feast and fatten on the misfortunes of the nation, leaving their countrymen moldering in the dust. That is what the surveillance profiteers have done since 9-11. In an orgy of greed, they have created a surveillance state the former East Germany would have envied. I hope my words today can do a small part in calling it out and reining it in. Having to choose liberty versus security is a false choice. We could live and have them both before 9-11 if NSA had listened to whistleblowers like Tom Drake and Kirk Wiebe. They had the ideas and knew how to and had in fact implemented their lawful, inexpensive and privacy protecting program. NSA may be willing to trade democracy for despotism and surrender freedom to fear. I am not. Mr. Snowden wishes he could attend these hearings, but for obvious and frankly deplorable reasons he cannot. Instead, I will be reading his words to you, which is only possible due to two of the unsung heroes in his harrowing saga. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks journalist Sarah Harrison, who literally rescued him from Hong Kong, orchestrated his safe passage to Russia, helped him obtain asylum, and who, in the case of Sarah Harrison, have literally been by his side every step of the way at great personal risk to herself. They have been not just stops on the 21st century version of the Underground Railroad, which liberates information from the shackles of security and transports it into the disinfecting sunlight of freedom. They have been the guardian shepherds who have kept him safe during this difficult journey. It's a tragic irony that in an effort to preserve your liberties and mine, they all have given up so many liberties of their own. The treatment of Julian, Sarah, and Ed, the example being made of them and all other whistleblowers, is the ultimate chilling effect on speech. Statement of Edward Snowden. I thank the European Parliament and the Lieb Committee for taking up the challenge of mass surveillance. The surveillance of whole populations rather than individuals threatens to be the greatest human rights challenge of our time. The success of economies in developed nations relies increasingly on their creative output. And if that success is to continue, we must remember that creativity is the product of curiosity, which in turn is the product of privacy. A culture of secrecy has denied our societies the opportunity to determine the appropriate balance between the human right of privacy and the governmental interest in investigation. These are not decisions that should be made for a people, but only by the people after full, informed, and fearless debate. Yet public debate is not possible without public knowledge. And in my country, the cost for one in my position of returning public knowledge to public hands has been persecution and exile. If we are to enjoy such debates in the future, we cannot rely upon individual sacrifice. We must create better channels for people of conscience 
to inform not only trusted agents of government, but independent representatives of the public outside of government. When I began my work, it was with the sole intention of making possible the debate we see occurring here in this body and in many other bodies around the world. Today we see legislative bodies forming new committees, calling for investigations and proposing new solutions for modern problems. We see emboldened courts that are no longer afraid to consider critical questions of national security. We see brave executives remembering that if a public is prevented from knowing how they are being governed, the necessary result is that they are no longer self-governing. And we see the public reclaiming an equal seat at the table of government. The work of a generation is beginning here with your hearings, and you have the full measure of my gratitude and support. Edward Snowden. Okay, thank you very much also for passing on his statement. Um, then we'll quickly move to Mr. David um, of Transparency International. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Many thanks to the committee for their invitation. It is a privilege uh, to be sharing a platform with um, Jess and many other uh, people I admire greatly. Um, as a public, uh, former public servant myself, I count myself very lucky that I, I never had to have my conscience or moral courage tested in the way that Kirk, Tom, Annie and others have. In many ways, whistleblowers are people of conscience who find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. My role as an advocate of transparency and accountability is to help create workplaces and legal frameworks that embrace rather than isolate those that find themselves confronted with the choice between remaining silent and serving themselves or speaking up and serving the public interest. Equally, my job is to help remove the burden on individuals to defend the public interest and place more responsibility on public institutions to protect fundamental rights and the common good. To that end, TI chapters have been campaigning for institutional reform and legal protection for whistleblowers for the best part of 20 years. More recently, we published principles for whistleblower legislation for, for parliamentarians. We're due to soon publish a report on legal safeguards for whistleblowers in the European Union. We're also operating helplines in about 50 countries, and so far we've assisted some 140,000 clients around the world. Uh, TI Ireland launched the first helpline for victims of corruption and whistleblowers in Western Europe. Um, or the first TI helpline uh, in, in Western Europe uh, two years ago. And we have helplines in Czech Republic, Romania, Hungary, and Luxembourg. should also uh, note the, the great work that Public Concern at Work are doing in the United Kingdom. Uh, they've led the agenda uh, on whistleblower legislation, not just in the UK, but around the world too. We assume rightly that intelligence agencies are responsible for protecting us from attack and upholding democratic principles. But the anti-corruption community has, to a large degree, underestimated the potential for abuse by members of the intelligence and security services. We have seen comparatively few well-publicized cases involving whistleblowers from the intelligence community in the EU. You're no doubt familiar with the case of Frank Greville, who blew the whistle on Denmark's case, intelligence case for, for intervention or invasion or the invasion of Iraq, as well as Annie and David Shaler's cases in the UK. In Ireland, we have not seen a public controversy surrounding intelligence services in around 40 years, not since allegations of support for the IRA by members of the Irish uh, Military Intelligence Service surfaced in 1972. That said, we have seen patterns of behaviour elsewhere in the public service that might be familiar to intelligence community whistleblowers. In 2010, officials of the Department of Social Welfare in Ireland were found to be passing on personal data of Irish citizens to insurance companies and private investigators. Earlier this year, two police whistleblowers reported that Irish police were unlawfully manipulating and cancelling police traffic records for family members and, and other police officers. We have noted how the same police whistleblowers 
have fallen victim to reprisal by their colleagues and police management. We've also recently seen how a journalist, Gemma O'Doherty, was recently fired after she investigated reports that the Chief of Police had his traffic offences cancelled too. This message, or the message this sends to whistleblowers and journalists is that reporting abuse is worse than the abuse itself. Information can be as valuable as any commodity or public asset. These cases demonstrate the risk of affording public servants undue discretion over the control of public or private property, including data, without the systems to hold them to account. They also demonstrate the need to protect whistleblowers in the intelligence community who might expose similar abuses of personal data and uh, citizen privacy. Intelligence whistleblowers are not afforded the, the legal right to blow the whistle on wrongdoing in intelligence agencies in most jurisdictions in the European Union. But intelligent whistleblowers are not alone. Most workers in all categories have few formal legal safeguards in the EU. This is in spite of the fact that according to the Association for Certified Fraud Examiners, some 40% of uh, fraud cases and corruption cases are exposed by whistleblowers. And while whistleblowers help detect wrongdoing, they also help prevent it happening in the first place. Workers who might be inclined to engage in wrongdoing may think twice if they know that their colleagues may report on that wrongdoing. Whistleblowers also help prevent many other forms of harm to the public interest. For example, the, the United Kingdom introduced whistleblower protection, the Public Interest Disclosure Act in 1998, after a series of disasters, including the capsizing of the Herald of Free Enterprise ferry in Zeebrugge with the loss of 193 lives, and the Clapham Rail Junction uh, crash in 1988 with the loss of some uh, 25 lives and 500 casualties. The UK government recognised that whistleblower protection and promotion could have helped in communicating the risk of dangerous practices that were not being addressed by employers. As it stands, the UK provides comprehensive, or is one of the few jurisdictions in the, in the European Union that provides comprehensive and consistent measures aimed at protecting whistleblowers in both the public and private sectors. But as Annie mentioned, even the UK doesn't protect whistleblowers in the intelligence services. Most EU jurisdictions only allow whistleblowers from certain sectors, such as healthcare or childcare, to report concerns or allow whistleblowers to report certain types, types of offences, such as fraud or child abuse. Legislation is also often written to define offences in restrictive ways. So while someone might be able to report corruption, for example, corruption may be strictly defined in law as the bribery of a public official. Whistleblowers might therefore not be protected if my computer's gone dead, sorry. Um, whistleblowers might therefore not be protected if they blow the whistle on the abuse of personal information or data, even where that abuse is for personal gain. This is particularly the, ca the case where that information is being abused by members of the security or intelligence services. Most EU jurisdictions also restrict the channels through which whistleblowers can report and only allow whistleblowers to report to designated persons, such as their employers or to the police. A whistleblower might not be protected even if they accidentally report to the wrong person or public agency. These restrictions, I would suggest, are having, having a chilling effect on whistleblowers and whistleblowing and the right of citizens to, to hold their public servants to account. TI, as well as the Council of Europe, have developed key principles for whistleblower legislation, which I mentioned earlier, and we would urge you to consider them in formulating any policy position or legislation on whistleblower protection in the European Union or its member states. I'll highlight three key principles which I think you should be cognizant of. Firstly, whistleblower law needs to provide protection for all workers, including those working in the defence and intelligence services, as well as contractors, trainees, uh, as well as uh, employees, and should protect them against formal reprisals such as dismissal or demotion, as well as informal sanctions such as harassment or bullying. It should afford opportunity not just to expose corruption, uh, not, it should afford the opportunity to whistleblowers not just to, to report 
uh, it, it, corruption and fraud, but also waste, gross negligence, and failure to perform legal duty, such as to protect the privacy or confidentiality of citizens' data. Finally, it should also uh, provide safe but multiple channels through which whistleblowers can report their concerns, while encouraging whistleblowers to go internally where they need to be able to report, or while encouraging whistleblowers to report internally, they should also have the opportunity to report externally uh, if the information is either uh, going to be covered up or not acted upon, or where the public interest demands that it be disclosed more widely. I'm glad to say that in Ireland, Parliament is now debating a comprehensive bill that draws from these principles and which are to a large degree premised on the experience of whistleblowers uh, around the world. It will also allow intelligence officers to, an opportunity to report internally and to a government minister. However, I should note that legislation alone cannot fix what is essentially a failure of democratic institutions to uphold the values and principles upon which they were founded. National Integrity Systems Research conducted by TI Chapters shows the need for our public institutions to be routinely assessed and their commitment to the rule of law and transparency held up to public scrutiny. The public have a right to information and have a right to the information they need to hold governments to account and our media needs, needs to be afforded the freedom to bring that information to public attention. As the plight of whistleblowers and journalists in my own country and elsewhere in Europe show, there is much to be done to create environments in which people feel safe to speak truth to power. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Um, and again, I apologize to both of you for you know, being uh, <coughs> squeezed a little bit. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to, is there anybody other than the Rapporteur in the Shadows who, Mrs. Morvai? That's it, Mr. Bronze, Mrs. Sippel. Okay, everybody gets one minute. We're going to have all questions, one minute strictly. So can you please watch the, the time? Mr. Rapporteur. Thank you, particularly to Jesslyn Raddock for um, that statement and to, to John as well. Um, you talked about these better channels for people of conscience to speak and Thomas Drake mentioned that you would answer this question about how we are going to um, mention that in our report. But to avoid this situation where you have this uh, presidential policy directive 19 so where you have in the United States what you say is a channel for whistleblowers to talk about things internally so my question is did Edward Snowden do what he did and I'm being devil's advocate here because this internal structure for whistleblowing was completely inadequate I'm sure you're going to say yes but tell us about this and is that why he had to say what he had to say in this dramatic um, and big way that he had to say it. And if we in the European Union have to avoid this, um, what do we recommend? You heard from Annie Mashon that the Public Interest uh, Disclosure Act, and it was mentioned by John Devitt, is inadequate. And if it's inadequate, what solutions have you thought about in the Government Accountability Project? One minute. Okay, as a rapporteur, you got nine seconds, but that doesn't apply to the others. This is a privilege. Uh, Mr. Voss, you have 60 seconds. Auf Deutsch. So, vielen Dank für Ihre Berichte. Das war sehr interessant. Thank you very much for your very interesting reports. My question is addressed in the same direction about these uh, revelations or whistleblowing. Is the press the only way people can go or are there internal or parliamentary opportunities for whistleblowing or some independent body such as an ombudsman where this sort of information can be passed on without this uh, exposing the person to danger? And I wonder if charges uh, through a prosecution body might also be an appropriate and sensible way for a whistleblower to release information whilst uh, guaranteeing their own personal security. Brecht is saving us 60 seconds by being absent. Uh, so is Mr. Kirkhope. That brings us to Mrs. Ernst. Yeah, that's getting a fix. Well, that was quick. 
Well, I would like to also come back to the question of protection of whistleblowers. Now, on the question of the lack of protection, in fact, how should we think about uh, whistleblowers? Should we see them, or are they seen as traitors, uh, people who are outside the scope of the law? How are things currently being dealt with? And could you say us quite clearly? Could you tell us quite clearly as to how you think whistleblowers should be protected? What uh, rules should we um, see enforced to protect them? Order, Mrs. Moravai, Mr. Bronze, Mrs. Sipple, and I'll ask the last question myself. <laughs> Mrs. Moravai. Thank you so much. It, it is extremely moving to hear the personal message of Mr. Snowden uh, to, uh, to us. We also um, obviously wish him very well, and we are very grateful to him, at least I hope uh, most of us. Um, he said in his very first interview, I believe, that uh, the thing he's most afraid of is not really Guantanamo, to my surprise, or, or charges, or death sentence, or whatever, but the possibility that uh, whatever he revealed will have no consequences. This sentence made me personally extremely uh, engaged in this whole uh, process. How satisfied do you think he is at this point in time with the process of the consequences, so to say, and uh, so far? <laughs> and as a lawyer, what do you think about uh, the personal future of Mr. Snowden? What is going to happen to him? And are we doing enough to protect his rights? Okay, Whether thank you, Europe Mr. Bronze. Yes, um, the EU itself isn't beyond criticism uh, as far as the war against whistleblowers is concerned. Uh, it's claimed that uh, employees have protection under the staff regulations of officials 2004, but it didn't do much to protect the job of Marta Andreasen, who was employed as chief accountant by the Commission, but sacked for whistleblowing in the very same year. Uh, indeed, not content with sacking her, uh, when she became member of this House, her appointment as Vice President of the Budget Committee was blocked. The case of an ex-MEP, I can't name him, I'm afraid, is even more sinister. He wrote a book earlier this year about financial irregularities of the EU and mentioning that he'd received information from EU whistleblowers. Within weeks, his house was raided by the police. The raid was completely illegal because he wasn't told the purpose of the search and they took away his computer and mobile phone. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sippel. I'll try and keep it brief. There is no organized uh, intent or conspiracy, but the impression is arising that various organizations, in particular secret services, are serving their own agenda in recent years. They've secured money and influence, and they're trying to hang on to that position and defend it and extend it as far as they can, and governments are finding it difficult to act against that unless, and this is a notion, they are co-authors, they share responsibility in this, and uh, perhaps through doing nothing or not uh, reacting, at least uh, they've made themselves responsible for the situation. If that's a possible thesis, then I wonder how it, successful it can be if those governments and legislators now try and put provisions to protect whistleblowers on the statute books when uh, that's the sort of thing we need in this situation. It will be the last one, uh, in particular to Mrs. Uh, Radak. You spoke about the uh, harassment of whistleblowers, journalists, uh, uh, their families, uh, friends, uh, what have you. What about lawyers? Is there a war on lawyers who represent whistleblowers? Do you feel that you can do your work freely and safely? Um, can I ask you to ask, answer the questions first, and then I'll come to Mr. Levitt? Sure. Um, I, I don't feel like I can do my work in a normal way that a lawyer would. I, I mean, I feel free and safe in terms of I haven't been subject, to my knowledge, to the kind of monitoring some of the lawyers at Guantanamo Bay have been. But certainly, I cannot, my clients can't just pick up the phone and call me. We have to meet in person, use throwaway cell phones, only communicate through encryption, pay in cash. 
I always joke that I use drug dealer tactics now to do my business. But seriously, the fact that I have to worry about that makes my work on a daily basis take so much longer than it should and completely changes my interaction with a normal client and a normal attorney-client relationship. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any of the other questions you would like to react to? Um, in terms of solutions, um, I think what you need is meaningful whistleblower reform. Now, with the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, there have been some reforms that help a lot of other categories of whistleblowers who are not national security or intelligence community um, in terms of giving them some sort of enforcement mechanism um, that will allow them to bring an independent cause of action. The problem, again, is that national security and intelligence uh, whistleblowers are specifically excluded. This touches on another question where someone brought up um, public policy directive number 19, um, which the president said in his speech would have protected Mr. Snowden. Um, that is completely false. That directive is not in effect yet, and it does not apply to contractors. Um, I think the press right now <laughs> seems to be the only way to go. But again, I think if we have channels working the way they're supposed to, then that is an avenue, as evidenced today by the fact that Mr. Snowden was willing to go through an official channel and address an official government body and talk to a government body when they are functioning the way they are supposed to. Um, in terms of how uh, satisfied is Snowden with the state of changes, um, in his own words he said that he is glad a conversation has begun about reforms and about how to change the situation. Um, initially in his initial statement he had said one of the biggest regrets would be if nothing happened. In other words, apathy. So I think by having hearings like the one you are today, the series of 12 hearings that your committee is having gives me great hope, and I think all whistleblowers great hope. In terms of his fu future, um, that depends on the willingness of the superpowers of the world to recognize that he has been granted asylum, meaning numerous countries have found that he has a valid fear of political persecution based on his political opinions. Therefore, he does not need to answer to pretextual criminal charges. A number of people throughout history who have been granted asylum have been under criminal process of their home persecuting nation. Um, right now, he is granted asylum, just like Julian Assange, and yet is not living freely. And I think we need to reach a point, and I think Europe, and I think rest, the rest of the world, in fact, is way ahead of the United States, where opinion is divided but about 60 percent, 40 percent, in terms of seeing him as a whistleblower and not a traitor. In general, I don't think those labels are helpful. Um, I think they're too binary, and we're just trying to slap labels and caricatures on people. Rather, look at the substance of what he disclosed and what it has done for the public debate and for the good of our country and for our world. Okay, just very quickly, not because I want to, to make this meeting any longer, and we've already overrun our time, but if you could make that last point more explicit, um, uh, following the question of Mrs. Ernst, uh, if, he, uh, if he used all the official channels at his um, disposal, would it then be automatic that he's charged with um, uh, you know, criminal offenses or that the terrorism laws or espionage laws are, are applied? Is that? That's absolutely true. If he had gone through official channels, I can tell you firsthand that I represented Thomas Drake from whom you heard earlier, an NSA official who went to the NSA General Counsel, the Department of Defense Inspector General, and to two bodies, both houses of Congress, and made disclosures. 
not only did nothing happen, the Department of Defense actually substantiated his concerns, but then immediately classified the report so no one could see it, and then later gave the name of Thomas and four other whistleblowers to the Justice Department for prosecution. In other words, the people it was supposed to protect, it completely sold down the river. So if Mr. Snowden, who did study the case of Thomas Drake and William Binney and Chelsea Manning, and saw that going through proper channels would result certainly in espionage charges, which have in fact been levied against him. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. David. I think there were four questions. Um, I, I was asked, or we were asked, uh, what provisions could be provided in law to protect intelligent, intelligence whistleblowers. Firstly, they, they need to be afforded the, the right to defend themselves in, in court. They need the right to um, not be dismissed or harassed um, like any other worker, uh, any right enjoyed by, by, by a worker uh, protected by whistleblower legislation. They need to be afforded the right against criminal, the, the, the defense against criminal and civil prosecution where they have reported according to the law. And the new protected disclosures bill in Ireland provides for these safeguards. It provides for in, immunity against civil and pr criminal prosecutions so long as they followed the law. Um, it should also provide, I think it's important uh, that whistleblowers know that the information that they provide will be acted upon. According to, to numerous um, bodies of research, one of the, the, the leading deterrents, one of the primary deterrents against whistleblowers uh, or whistleblowing, one of the key reasons why people don't come forward is the belief that nothing will be done and there needs to be a legal duty and those who receive information to act on that information. <laughs> Um, Mr. Voss asked, um, should information be passed on internally uh, and, and should it be dealt with by, by employers? Absolutely. And, and in the UK and Ireland, as, as elsewhere around the world, in New Zealand and, and in South Africa, there is a, 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 there's provision for uh, encouraging workers to report internally. Uh, they're expected to report to their line manager or, or to the employer unless there is a good reason not to do so, unless there's a public interest in going outside the organization, either to their member of parliament, uh, to a regulator, or, or to the media. Um, Ms. Ernst asked, uh, are, are uh, whistleblowers traitors? Um, again, I, 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 I know it's a rhetorical question, um, but um, uh, I agree entirely with Jesslyn. I, I, I don't think these labels, either heroes or traitors, are, are particularly helpful um, but to a large degree, I think it depends on who's setting the narrative. Um, I, I know this is a rhetorical question. This is not a statement you were Juristisch, making. In juristical, uh, in juristical uh, way. Um, in juristical way. Ich möchte gerne wissen, in juristischer... In a legal way, how is that going to be arranged? Legally speaking, how is the whistleblower going to be seen? Is it going to be seen as, some, as a traitor to the state? On what basis, on what legal basis? Sorry, I was, I, was, I was going to say it really depends on who is setting the narrative. Uh, and we need, to, we need to tell the stories of whistleblowers. We need to stand up for whistleblowers, and whistleblowers need legal protection. Um, finally, I'd also point out that whistleblowers in international and interregional inter organizations need protection. Uh, every bit as much as, as, uh, as whistleblowers in national institutions. Um, and I know there was another question. I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Sybil. Uh, the question is, if you really can be sure that action will be taken by governments to protect whistleblowers, especially in the case of secret services, because they may be involved or are not willing to open what is happening. I think, I think to a large degree that depends on, on the level of public demand for this. If, if, if politicians don't see this as a priority, they're not going to, to legislate for it. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to first uh, thank all our, uh, our speakers today. Uh, thank you for coming here and giving evidence. Secondly, I would like to thank the interpreters for staying longer. And thirdly, I would like to thank the audience for being so patient and staying until the end. 
Uh, that concludes today's session. Thank you and see you next time.